Chapter 10 of Mountaineering in the Sierra Nevada by Clarence King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 10 Cut Off Cobbles. One October day, as Kawea and I traveled by ourselves over a lonely foothill trail, I came to consider myself the friend of woodpeckers. With rather more reserve as regards the blue jay, let me admit great interest in his worldly wisdom. As an instance of cooperative living, the partnership of these two birds is rather more hopeful than most mundane experiments. For many autumn and winter months, such food as their dainty taste chooses is so rare throughout the Sierras that in default of any climatic temptation to migrate, the birds get in harvests with annual regularity and surprising labor. Oak and pine mingle in open growth. Acorns from the one are their grain. The soft pine bark is the granary. And this is the process. Armies of woodpeckers drill small round holes in the bark of standing pine trees, sometimes perforating it thickly, up to 20 or 30 and even 40 feet above the ground. And then about equal numbers of woodpeckers and jays gather acorns, rejecting always the little cup, and insert the gland tightly in the pine bark, with its tender base outward and exposed to the air. A woodpecker, having drilled a hole, has its exact measure in mind, and after examining a number of acorns makes his selection, and never fails of a perfect fit. Not so the jolly, careless jay, who picks up any sound acorn he finds, and, if it's not too large for a hole, drops it in the most offhand way, as if it were an affair of no consequence, utters one of his dry, chuckling squawks, and either tries another or loafs about lazily watching the hard-working woodpeckers. Thus they live, amicably harvesting, and with the sequel. Those acorns in which grubs form become the sole property of woodpeckers, while all sound ones fall to the jays. Ordinarily, chances are in favor of woodpeckers, and when they are absolutely no sound nuts, the jays sell short, so to speak, and go over to Nevada and speculate in juniper berries. The monotony of hill and glade failing to interest me, and in default of other diversion, I all day long watch the birds, recalling how many gay and successful jays I knew who lived as these on the wit and industry of less ostentatious woodpeckers, thinking, too, what naively dogmatic and richly worded political economy Mr. Ruskin would phrase from my feathered friends. Thus I came to Ruskin, wishing I might see the work of his idol, and after that longing for some equal artist who should arise and choose to paint our Sierras as they are, with all their color glory, power of innumerable pine and countless pinnacle, gloom of tempest or splendor, where rushing light shatters itself upon granite crag or burns in dying rose upon far fields of snow. Had I rubbed Aladdin's lamp? A turn in the trail brought suddenly in view a man who sat under shadow of oaks, painting upon a large canvas. As I approached, the artist turned half round in his stool, rested palette and brushes upon one knee, and in familiar tone said, "'Durned if you ain't just naturally catch me at it. Get off and set down. You ain't going for no doctor, I know.' My artist was of short, good-natured, butcher-boy makeup, dressed in what had formerly been black broadcloth, with an enlivening show of red flannel shirt about the throat, wrists, and a considerable display of the same, where his waistcoat might have once overlapped a strained but as yet coherent waistband. The cut of these garments, by length of coat tail and voluminous leg, proudly asserted a bay origin. His small feet were squeezed into tight short boots with high raking heels. A round face, 
with small, full mouth, non-committal nose, and black protruding eyes, showed no more sign of the ideal temperament than did the broad daub upon his square yard of canvas. "'Going to Copples?' inquired my friend. "'That was my destination,' I answered. "'Yes.' "'That's me,' he ejaculated. "'Right over there, down below those two oaks. "'Ever there?' "'No. "'My studio's there now,' giving impressive accent to the word. "'All the while, as these few words were passing, "'he scrutinized me with unconcealed curiosity, "'puzzled, as well he might be, by my dress and equipment.' Finally, after I had tied Kawea to a tree and seated myself by the easel, and after he had absently rubbed some raw sienna into his little store of white, he softly ventured, Was ye out looking for a ditch? No, I replied. He neatly rubbed up the white and sienna with his blender, unconsciously adding a dash of Veronese green, gazed at my leggings, and then at the barometer, and again meeting my eye with a look as if he feared I might be a disguised duke, said in a slow tone, with hyphens of silence between each two syllables, giving to his language all the dignity of an unabridged Webster, I would take pleasure in stating that my name is Hank G. Smith, artist. And seeing me smile, he relaxed a little, and giving the blender another vigorous twist, added, I would request yours. Mr. Smith, having learned my name, occupation, and that my home was on the Hudson, near New York, quickly assumed a familiar me-and-you old fellow tone, and rattled on merrily about his winter in New York, spent in going through the academy, a period of deep moment to one who before that painted only wagons for his livelihood. Storing away canvas, stool, and easel in a deserted cabin close by, he rejoined me, and, leading Kawea by his lariat, I walked beside Smith down the trail toward Copples. He talked freely, and as if composing his own biography, beginning, California born and mountain raised, his nature soon drove him into a painter's career. Then he reverted fondly to New York and his experience there. Oh, no, he mused in pleasant irony. He never spread his napkin over his legs and partook French fiddles up to old Delmonico's. That wasn't H.G. which took her to the theater. In a sort of stage aside to me, he added, she was a model. Stood for them sculptors, you know, perfectly virtuous and built from the ground up. Then, as if words failed him, made an expressive gesture with both hands over his shirt bosom to indicate the topography of her figure, and sliding them down sharply against his waistband, he added, anatomical torso. Mr. Smith found relief in meeting one so near himself as he conceived me to be in habit and experience, the long pent-up emotions and ambitions of his life found ready utterance and a willing listener. I learned that his aim was to become a characteristically California painter, with special designs for making himself famous as the delineator of mule trains and ox wagons, to be, as he expressed it, the Pacific Slope Bonheur. There, he said, is old Eastman Johnson. He's made the riffle on Barnes and that everlasting girl with the ears of corn. But it ain't life. It ain't got the real get-up. If you want to see the thing, just look at a Jerome. His Arab folks and Egyptian dancing girls, they ain't assuming a pleasant expression and looking at spots while their likeness is took. Mm, H.G. will discount Eastman yet. He avowed his great admiration of church, which, with a little leaning toward Mr. Gifford, seemed his only hearty approval. It's all beer stat, beer stat, and beer stat nowadays. 
What has he done but twist and skew and distort, discolor and belittle and be pretty this whole doggone country? Why, his mountains are too high and too slim. They'd blow over in one of our fall winds. I've herded colts two summers in Yosemite, and honest now, when I stood right up in front of his picture, I didn't know it. He hasn't what old Ruskin calls for. By this time, the station buildings were in sight, and far down the canyon, winding an even grade around spur after spur, outlined by a low, clinging cloud of red dust, we could see the great Sierra mule train, that industrial gulf stream flowing from California plains over into arid Nevada, carrying thither materials for life and luxury. In a vast perpetual caravan of heavy wagons, drawn by teams of from eight to fourteen mules, all the supplies of many cities and villages were hauled across the Sierra at an immense cost, and with such skill of driving and generalship of mules as the world has never seen before. Our trail descended toward the grade, quickly bringing us to a high bank immediately overlooking the trains a few rods below the group of station buildings. I had by this time learned that Copples, the former station proprietor, had suffered amputation of the leg three times, receiving from the roadmen, in consequence, the name of Cutoff, and that, while his doctors disagreed as to whether they better try a fourth, the kindly hand of death had spared him that pain, and Mrs. Copples an added extortion in the bill. The dying Cutoff had made his wife promise she would stay by and carry on the station until all his debts, which were many and heavy, should be paid, and then do as she chose. The poor woman, a New Englander of some refinement, lingered, sadly fulfilling her task, the longing for liberty. When Smith came to speak of Sarah Jane, her niece, a new light kindled in my friend's eye. You never saw Sarah Jane, he inquired. I shook my head. He went on to tell me that he was living in hope of making her Mrs. H.G., but that the barkeeper also indulged a hope, and as this important functionary was a man of ready cash and of derringers and few words, it became a delicate matter to avow open rivalry. But it was evident my friend Starr was ascendant, and learning that he considered himself to possess the deadwood and to have gated the barkeeper, I was more than amused, even comforted. It was a pleasure to sit there, leaning against a vigorous old oak, while Smith opened his heart to me, in easy confidence and with quick eye watching the passing mules, penciled in a little sketchbook, a leg, a head, or such portions of body and harness as seemed to him useful for future works. These are notes, he said, and I've pretty much made up my mind to paint my great picture on a jeepole. I'll scumble in a sunset effect, lighting up the dust, and striking across the backs of team and driver, and I'll paint a come up there, don't you look, on the old teamster's face, and the mules will be just a humping their little selves and laying down to work like they'd expire. And the wagon, don't you see what fine color material there is and the heavy load and the canvas top with sunlight and shadow in the folds? And that's what's the matter with H.G. Smith. Orders, sir, orders. That's what I'll get then. And I'll take my little old Sarah Jane and light out for New York, and you'll see Smith on a studio door plate, and folks will say, Fine feeling for nature has Smith. I let the singular man speak for himself in his own vernacular, pruning nothing of its idiom or slang, as you choose to call it. In this faithful transcript, there are words I could have wished to expunge, but they are his, not mine, and illustrate his mental construction. The breath of most Californians is as unconsciously charged with slang as an Italian's of garlic, and the two, after all, have much the same function. You touch the bowl, or your language, 
but should never let either be fairly recognized in salad or conversation. But Smith's English was the well undefiled when compared with what I every moment heard from the current of teamsters which set constantly by us in the direction of Copples. Close in front came a huge wagon piled high with cases of freight and drawn along by a team of twelve mules whose heavy breathing and drenched skins showed them hard work and well tired out. The driver looked anxiously ahead at a soft spot in the road and on at the station as if calculating hmm, whether his team had courage left to haul through. He called kindly to them, cracked his black snake whip, and altogether they strained bravely on. The great van rocked, settled in a little on the rear side, and stuck fast. With a look of despair, the driver got off and laid the lash freely among his team. They jumped and jerked, frantically tangled themselves up, and at last all sulked and became stubbornly immovable. Meanwhile, a mile of teams behind, unable to pass on the narrow grade, came to an unwilling halt. About five wagons back, I noticed a tall pike, dressed in checkered shirt and pantaloons tucked into jackboots. A soft felt hat, worn on the back of his head, displayed long locks of flaxen hair, which hung freely about a florid pink countenance, noticeable for its pair of violent little blue eyes and facial angle rendered acute by a sharp long nose. This fellow watched the stoppage with impatience, and at last, when it was more than he could bear, walked up by the other teams with a look of wrath absolutely devilish. One would have expected him to blow up with rage, yet withal his gait and manner were cool and soft in the extreme. In a bland, almost tender voice, he said to the unfortunate driver, My friend, perhaps I can help you. In his gentle way of disentangling and patting the leaders as he headed them round in the right direction would have given him a high office under Mr. Berg. He leisurely examined the embedded wheel, cast an eye along the road ahead. He then began, in rather excited manner, to swear, pouring it out louder and more profane till he utterly eclipsed the most horrid blasphemies I ever heard, piling them up thicker and more fiendish till it seemed as if the very earth must open and engulf him. I noticed one mule after another give a little squat, bringing their breasts hard against the collars and straining traces till only one old mule, with ears back and dangling chain, still held out. The pike walked up and yelled one gigantic oath. Her ears sprang forward. She squatted in terror, and the iron links grated under her strain. He then stepped back and took the rein, every trembling mule looking out of the corner of its eye and glistening at Quivive, with a peculiar air of deliberation and of childlike simplicity. He said in everyday tones, Come up there, mules. One quick strain, a slight rumble, and the wagon rolled on to Copples. Smith and I followed, and as we neared the house, he punched me familiarly and said, as a brown petticoat disappeared in the station door, ah, there's Sarah Jane. When I see that girl, I feel like I'd like to reach out and gather her in. Then clasping her imaginary form, as if she was about to dance with him, he executed a couple of waltz turns, softly intimating, and that's what's the matter with H.G. Kawea being stabled, we betook ourselves to the office, which was, of course, bar room as well. As I entered, the unfortunate teamster was about paying his liquid compliment to the florid pike. Their glasses were filled, my respects, said the little driver. The whiskey became lost to view and went eroding its way through the dust these poor fellows had swallowed. He added, 
Well, Billy, you can swear. Swear, repeated the pike in a tone of incredulous questioning. Me swear? As if the compliment were greater than his modest dessert. No, I can't blaspheme worth the cuss. You just ought to hear Pete Green. He can exhort the impenitent mule. I've known a ten mule team to renounce the flesh and haul thirty one thousand through a foot of clay mud under one of his outpourings. As a hotel, Cobbles is on the Mongolian plan, which means that dining room and kitchen are given over to the mercies, never very tender, of Chinamen. Not such Chinamen as learned the art of pig roasting that they might be served up by Aaliyah, but the average John, and a sadly low average that John is. I grant him a certain general air of thrift, admitting, too, that his lack of sobriety never makes itself apparent in loud Celtic brawl. But he is, when all is said, and in spite of timid and fawning obedience, a very poor servant. Now and then at one friend's house, it has happened to me that I dined upon artistic Chinese cookery, and all they who come home from living in China smack their lips over the relishing cuisine. I wish they had sat down that day at Cobble's. No, on second thought, I would spare them. John may go peacefully to North Adams and make shoes for us, but I shall not solve the awful domestic problem by bringing him into my kitchen. Certainly so as long as Howell's Mrs. Johnson lives, nor even while I can get an Irish lady to torment me and offer the hospitality of my home to her cousins. After the warning bell, fifty or sixty teamsters inserted their dusty heads in buckets of water, turned their once white neck handkerchiefs inside out, producing a sudden effect of clean linen, and made use of the two mournful wrecks of combs which hung on strings at either side of the couple's mirror. Many went to the bar and partook of a dust cutter. There was then such clearing of throats and such loud and prolonged blowing of noses as may not often be heard upon this globe. In the calm which ensued, conversation sprung up on lead harness, the Stockton wagon that had went off the grade, with here and there a sentiment called out by two framed lithographic bells, who in great richness of color and scantiness of raiment, flanked the bar mirror. That, a dazzling reflector, chiefly destined to portray the barkeeper's back hair, which work of art involved much affectionate labor. A second bell and rolling away of doors revealed a long dining room with three parallel tables, cleanly set and watched over by Chinamen, whose fresh white clothes and bright olive buff skin made a contrast of color which was always chief among my yearnings for the Nile. While I loitered in the background, every seat was taken, and I found myself with a few dilatory teamsters destined to await a second table. The dining room communicated with the kitchen beyond by means of two square apertures cut in the partition wall. Through these portholes, a glare of red light poured, except when the square framed a Chinese cook's head or discharged hundreds of little dishes. The teamsters sat down in patience. A few of the more elegant sort cleaned their nails with the three tine forks, others picked their teeth with them, and nearly all speared with this implement small specimens from the dishes before them, securing a pickle or a square inch of pie, or even that luxury, a dried apple. A few, on tilted back chairs, drummed upon the bottom of their plates the latest tune of the road. When fairly underway, the scene became active and animated beyond belief. Waiters balancing upon their arms, twenty or thirty plates, hurried along and shot them dexterously over the teamsters' heads with crash and spatter, beans swimming in fat, meats slimed with pale, ropey gravy, 
and over everything a faint mongol odor. Sharks and wolves may no longer be figured as types of prandial haste. My friends, the Teamsters, stuffed and swallowed with a rapidity which was alarming, but for the dexterity they showed, and which could only have come of long practice. In fifteen minutes the room was empty, and those fellows who were not feeding grain to their mules lighted cigars and lingered around the bar. Just then my artist rushed in, seized me by the arm, and said in my ear, We'll have our supper over to Mrs. Copple's. Oh, I guess not, Sarah Jane. Arms peeled, cooking up stuff. Old woman got into the milk room with the skimmer. Hmm. He then added that if I wanted to see what I had been spared, I might follow him. We went round an angle of the building and came upon a high bank where, through wide open windows, I could look into the Chinese kitchen. By this time the second table of teamsters were under way, and the waiters yelled their orders through to the three cooks. This large unpainted kitchen was lighted up by kerosene lamps. Through clouds of smoke and steam, dodged and sprang the cooks, dripping with perspiration and grease, grabbing a stake in the hand and slapping it down on the gridiron, slipping and sliding around on the damp floor, dropping a cart of biscuits and picking them up again in their fists, which were garnished by the whole bill of fare. The red papers with Chinese inscriptions and little joss sticks here and there pasted upon each wall, the spry devils themselves and that faint sickening odor of China which pervaded the room, combined to produce a sense of deep sober gratitude that I had not risked their fare. Now, demanded Smith, you see that there little white building yonder? I did. He struck a contemplative position, leaned against the house, extending one hand after the manner of the minstrel sentimentalist, and softly chanted, "'Tis, so tis the car to jove me love, "'and there's where they're getting up as nice a little supper "'as can be found on this road or any other. "'Let's go over.' So we strolled across an open space where there were two giant pines towering somber against the twilight, a little mountain brooklet, and a few quiet cows. Stop, said Smith, leaning his back against a pine and encircling my neck affectionately with an arm. I told you, as regards Sarah Jane, how my feelings stand. Well, now... You just bet she's on the reciprocate. When I told old woman Cobbles I'd like to invite you over, Sarah Jane, she passed me in the doorway and said she, glad to see your friends. Then, sotto voce, for we were very near, he sang again, Tis, so tis the car, did you be love? And, C.K., he continued familiarly, you're a judge of women chucking his knuckles into my ribs, whereat I jumped, and then he added, Ha, ah, there, I knew you was. Well, Sarah Jane is a darned magnificent female. Number three boot, just the right height for me. Venus de Copples, I call her, and would make the most touching artist wife on this planet. If I designed to paint a head, or a foot, or an arm, get my little old Sarah Jane to peel the particular charm and just whack her in on the canvas. We passed in through low doors, turned from a small dark entry into the family sitting room, and were alone there in presence of a cheery log fire, which good-naturedly bade us welcome, crackling freely and tossing its sparks out upon the floor of pine and coyote-skin rug. A few old framed prints hung upon dark walls, their faces looking serenely down upon the scanty, old-fashioned furniture and windows full of flowering plants. A low cushioned chair, not long since vacated, was drawn close by the center table, whereon were a lamp and a large open Bible with a pair of silver-bowed spectacles lying upon its lighted page. Smith made a gesture of silence toward the door, touched the Bible, and whispered, 
here's where old woman Copple lives, and it's a good thing. I read it aloud to her evenings, and I can just feel the high local lights of it. It'll fetch H.G. yet. At this juncture, the door opened. A pale, thin, elderly woman entered, and with tired smile greeted me. While her hard, labor-stiffened, needle-roughened hand was in mine, I looked into her face and felt something, it may be, it must be but little, yet something, of the sorrow of her life, that of a woman large in sympathy, deep in faith, eternal in constancy, thrown away on a rough, worthless fellow. All things she hoped for had failed her, the tenderness which never came, the hopes, years ago in ashes, the whole world of her yearnings, long buried, leaving only the duty of living and the hope of heaven. As she sat down, took up her spectacles and knitting, and closed the Bible, she began pleasantly to talk to us of the warm, bright autumn nights, of Smith's work, and then of my own profession, and of her niece, Sarah Jane. Her genuinely sweet spirit and natively gentle manner were very beautiful and far overbalanced all traces of rustic birth and mountain life. Oh, that unquenchable Christian fire, how pure the gold of its result. It needs no practiced elegance, no social greatness for its success. Only the warm human heart and out of it shall come a sacred calm and gentleness such as no power, no wealth, no culture may ever hope to win. No words of mine would outline the beauty of that plain, weary old woman, the sad, sweet patience of those gray eyes, nor the spirit of overflowing goodness which cheered and enlivened the half hour we spent there. H.G. might perhaps be pardoned, for showing an alacrity when the door again opened and Sarah Jane rolled, I might almost say trundled, in, and was introduced to me. Sarah Jane was an essentially Californian product, as much so as one of those vast potatoes or massive pears. She had a suggestion of state fair in the fullness of her physique, yet withal was pretty and modest. If I could have rid myself of a fear that her buttons might sooner or later burst off and go singing by my ear, I think I might have felt as H.G. did, that she was a magnificent female with her smooth, brilliant skin and ropes of soft brown hair. H.G., in the presence of the ladies, lost something of his original flavor and rose into studied elegance, greatly to the comfort of Sarah whose glow of pride as his talk ran on, came without show of restraint. The supper was delicious. But Sarah was quiet, quiet to H.G. and to me, until after tea, when the old lady said, You young folks will have to excuse me this evening, and withdrew to her chamber. More logs were then piled on the sitting-room hearth, and we three gathered in semicircle. Presently H.G. took the poker and twisted it about among coals and ashes, prying up the oak sticks, as he announced in a measured, steady way, An artist's wife, that is, he explained. An academician's wife, order. Well, she order sabe the beautiful, and take her regular aesthetics. And then again he continued in explanatory tone. She ought to know how to keep a hotel, durned if she hadn't, for it's rough like first off, for a feller gets his name up. But then, when he does, though, she's got a salubrious old time of it. It's touch a little bell. He pressed the andiron top to show us how the thing was done. And Brooks, the morning paper you'd open your regular herald. Art notes. 
another of H. G. Smith's tender works entitled Off the Grade, so full of outdoors and subtle feeling of nature, is now on exhibition at Group Hell's. Look down a little further. Italian Opera. Between the acts, all eyes turned to the distingue, Mrs. H. G. Smith, who looked, then turning to me and waving his hand at Sarah Jane. I leave it to you if she don't. Sarah Jane assumed the pleasing color of the sugar beet without seeming inwardly unhappy. It's only a question of time with H.G., continued my friend. Art is long, you know, durned long, and it may be a year before I paint my great picture, but after that, Smith works in lead harness. He used the poker freely, and more and more his flow of hopes turned a shade of sentiment to Sarah Jane, who smiled broader and broader, showing teeth of healthy whiteness. At last I withdrew and sought my room, which was H.G.'s also, in his studio. I had gone with a candle around the walls, whereon were tacked studies and sketches, finding here and there a bit of real merit among the profusion of trash, when the door burst open and my friend entered, kicked off his boots and trousers, and walked up and down in a sort of quadrille step, singing, Yes, tis the cottage of me love, you bet. It's the cottage of me love. And what's more, H.G. has just had his genteel goodnight kiss, and when and where is the old barkeep? I checked his exuberance at best I might, knowing full well that the quiet and elegant dispenser of neat and mixed beverages hearing this inquiry would put in an appearance in person and offer a few remarks designed to provoke ill feeling. So I at last got Smith in bed and the lamp out. All was quiet for a few moments, and when I had almost gotten to sleep, I heard my roommate in low tones say to himself, Married by the Rev. Gospel, our talented California artist, Mr. H. G. Smith, to Miss Sarah Jane Copples. No cards. A pause, and then with more gentle utterance. And that's what's the matter with H. G. Slowly from this atmosphere of art, I passed away into the tranquil land of dreams. End of chapter 10 Cut Off Copples Chapter 11 of Mountaineering in the Sierra Nevada by Clarence King This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11 Shasta. We escaped the harvesting season of 1870. I try to believe all its poetry is not forever immolated under the strong wheels of that pastoral juggernaut of our day, the steam reaper, and to be grateful that Ruth's have not now to glean the fallen wheat heads and loaf around at questionable hours setting their caps for susceptible ranchers. Whatever stirring rhythm may today measure time with the quick fire breath of reaping machines shall await a more poetic pen than this. Some modern Virgil, coming along the boundless wheat plain, may perhaps sing you bucolic phrases of the new Iron Age, but he will soon see his mistake, as will you. The harvest home with its Longfellow mellowness of atmosphere, or even those ideally colored barns of Eastman Johnson's, with corn and girls and some of the lingering personal relationship between crops and human hands, all that is tradition here, not even memory. It is quite as well. These people are more germane with enterprise and hurry and with the winding-up drink at some vulgar tavern when hired hands are paid off and gather to have a real nice time with the boys. This was over. The herds of men had poured back to their cities, 
and wandered away among distant mines as far as their earnings would carry them. A few stranded bummers who awoke from their nice time penniless still lingered in pathetic humiliation around the scene of their labor, rather heightening that air of sleep which now pervaded every ranch in the Sacramento Valley. We quitted the hotel at Chico with relief, gratefully turning our backs upon the Chinaman whose cookery had spoiled our two days' peace. Mr. Freeman Clark will have to make out a better case for Confucius, or else these fellows were apostate. But they were soon behind us, a straight, dusty avenue, leading us past clusters of ranches into a quiet expanse of level land and beneath the occasional shadow of roadside oaks. Miles of harvested plain lay close-shaven in monotonous Naples yellow, stretching on, soft and vague, losing itself in a gray, half-luminous haze. Now and then, through more transparent intervals, we could see the brown Sierra feet walling us in to eastward, their oak-clad tops fainter and fainter as they rose into the sky. Directly overhead hung an arch of pale blue, but a few degrees down the hue melted into golden gray. Looming through the mist before us rose somber forms of trees, growing in processions along the margins of snow-fed streams which flow from the Sierra across the Sacramento River. Through these silent, sleepy groves, the seclusion is perfect. You come in from blinding, sun-scorched plains to the great aged oaks, whose immense breadth of bough seems outstretched with effort to shade more and more ground. Alders and cottonwoods line the stream banks. Native grapes and tropical profusion drape the shores and hang in trailing curtains from tree to tree. Here and there, glimpses open into dark thickets. The stream comes into view between walls of green. Evening sunlight, broken with shadow, falls over rippling shallows. Still expanses of deep pool reflect blue from the zenith and flow on into dark shaded coves beneath overhanging verdure. Vineyards and orchards gather themselves pleasantly around ranch houses. Men and women are dull, unrelieved. They are all alike. The eternal flatness of landscape, the monotony of endlessly pleasant weather, the scarcely varying near, the utter want of anything unforeseen, an absence of all surprise in life, are legible upon their quiet, uninteresting faces. They loaf through eleven months to harvest one. Individuality is wanting. The same kind of tiresome ranch gossip you hear at one table spreads itself over listening acres to the next. The great American poet, it may confidently be predicted, will not book his name from the Sacramento Valley. The people, the acres, the industry seem to be created solely to furnish vulgar fractions in the census. It was not wholly fancy that detected in the grapes something of the same flatness and sugary insipidity which characterized the girls I chatted with on certain piazzas. What an antipode is the condition of sterile poverty in the farm life of the East. Frugality, energy, self-preserving mental activity contrast sharply with the contented lethargy of this commonplace opulence. Mile after mile, in recurring succession of wheatland and vineyard, oak grove and dusty shabbiness of graceless ranch buildings, stretches on, flanking our way on either side, until at last the undulations of the foothills are reached, and the first signs of vigorous life are observed in the trees. Attitude and consciousness are displayed in the lordly oaks which cluster upon brown hillsides. The Sacramento, which through the slumberous plain had flowed in a still, deep current, reflecting only the hot haze and motionless forms of the trees upon its banks, here courses along with the ripple of life 
displaying through its clear waters boulders and pebbles freighted from the higher mountains. Our road, ascending through sunny valleys and among rolling oak-clad hills, at length reaches the level of the pines, and, climbing to a considerable crest, descends among a fine coniferous forest into the deeply wooded valley of the pit. Lifted high against the sky, ragged hills of granite and limestone limit the view. The river, through a sharp rocky canyon, has descended from the volcanic plains of northeastern California, cutting its way across the Sea of Hills, which represents the Sierra Nevada, and falling toward the west in a series of white rapids. Our camp in the cool mountain air banished the fatigues of weary miles. Night, under the mountain stars, gave us refreshing sleep, and from the morning we crossed Pitt Ferry, we dated a new life. In a deep gorge between lofty pine-clad walls, we came upon the McLeod, a brilliantly pure stream wearing its way through lava rocks and still bearing the ice chill of Shasta. Dark feathery firs stand in files along the swift river. Oaks with lustrous leaves rise above hill slopes of red and brown. Numbers of Indian camps are posted here. I find them picturesque. Low conical huts, opening upon small smoking fires attended by squaws, numberless salmon, split and drawing in rows upon light scaffoldings, make their light red conspicuous amid generally dingy surroundings. These Indian faces are fairly good-natured, especially when young. I visited one camp upon the left river bank, finding Madame at home seated by her fireside, engaged in maternal duties. I'm almost afraid to describe the squalor and grotesque hideousness of her person. She was emaciated and scantily clad in a sort of short petticoat, shaggy, unkempt hair overhanging a pair of wild wolf's eyes. The ribs and collarbones stood out as upon an anatomical specimen, hard black flesh clinging in formless masses upon her body and arms. Altogether, she had the appearance of an animated mummy. Her child, a mere amorphous roll, clung to her and emphasized with cubbish fatness the wan, shrunken form of its mother, looking like some ravenous leech which was draining the woman's very blood. Shuddering, I hurried away to observe the husband. He was spearing salmon a short distance downstream, his naked form poised upon a beam which projected over the river, his eyes riveted and spear uplifted waiting for the prey. Sunlight streaming down in broken masses through trees fell brilliantly upon his muscular shoulder and tense, compact thigh, glancing now and then across rigid arms in the polished point of his spear. The swift dark water rushed underneath him, flashing upon its surface a shimmering reflection of his red figure. Cast in bronze, he would have made a companion for Quincy Ward's Indian hunter, and better than a companion, for in his wolfish sinew and panther muscle there was not, so far as I could observe, that free Greek suppleness which is so fine a feature in Mr. Ward's statue. Though Ajax, disguised as an American Indian, might be a better name for that great and powerful piece of sculpture. A day's march brought us from McLeod to the Sacramento, here a small stream, with banks fringed by a pleasing variety of trees and margins graceful with water plants. Northward for two days, we followed closely the line of the Sacramento River, now descending along slopes to its bed, where the stream played among picturesque rocks and boulders, and again climbing by toilsome ascents into the forest a thousand feet up on the canyon wall, catching glimpses of towering ridges of pine-clad sierra above and curves of the foaming river deep in the blue shadow beneath us. More and more, the woods became darkened with mountain pine, the air freshened by northern life, 
gave us the inspiration of altitude. At last, through a notch to the northward, rose the conical summit of Shasta, its pale, rosy lavas enameled with ice. Body and base of the great peak were hidden by intervening hills over whose smooth rolls of forest green the bright blue sky and the brilliant Shasta summit were sharp and strong. From that moment, the peak became the center of our life. From every crest we strained our eyes forward, as now and then, either through forest vistas, the incandescent snow greeted us, or from some high summit, the opening canyon walls displayed grander and grander views of the great volcano. It was sometimes, after all, a pleasure to descend from these cool heights, with the impression of the mountain upon our minds, to the canyon bottom, where among the endlessly varying bits of beautiful detail, the mental strain wore off. When our tents were pitched at Sisson's, while a picturesque haze floated up from southward, we enjoyed the grand, uncertain form of Shasta, with its heaven-piercing crest of white and wide, placid sweep of base, full of lines as deeply reposeful as a Greek temple, its dark head lifted among the fading stars of dawn and strongly set upon the arch of coming rose, appealed to our emotions, but best we like to sit at evening near Munger's easel, watching the great lava cone glow with light almost as wild and lurid as if its craters still streamed. Watkins thought it photographic luck that the mountain should so have draped itself with mist as to defy his camera. Palmer stayed at camp to make observations in the coloring of meerschaums at fixed altitudes and to watch now and then the station barometer. Shasta from Sissons is a broad triple mountain, the central summit being flanked on the west by a large and quite perfect crater whose rim reaches about 12,000 feet altitude. On the west, a broad shoulder-like spur juts from the general slope. The cone rises from its base 11,000 feet in one sweep. A forest of tall, rich pines surrounds Strawberry Valley and the little group of ranches near Sissons. Under this high sky and a pure quality of light, the whole varied foreground of green and gold stretches out toward the rocky mountain base in charming contrast. Brooks from the snow thread their way through the open meadow, waving overhead a tent work of willows, silvery and cool. Shasta as a whole is the single cone of an immense extinct volcano. It occupies almost precisely the axial line of the Sierra Nevada, but the range, instead of carrying its great wave-like ridge through this region, breaks down in the neighborhood of Lassen's Butte, and for 80 miles northward is only represented by low, confused masses of mountain cut through and through by the canyons of the McLeod, Pitt, and Sacramento. A broad volcanic plain, interrupted here and there by inconsiderable chains, occupies the country east of Scott's Mountain. From this general plain, whose altitude is from 2,500 to 3,500 feet, rises Mount Shasta. About its base cluster hillocks of a hundred little volcanoes, but they are utterly inconspicuous under the shadow of the great peak. The volcanic plain land is partly overgrown by forest and in part covers itself with fields of grass or sage. Riding over it in almost any part the one great point in the landscape is the cone of Shasta. Its crest of solid white, its vast altitude, the pale gray or rosy tints of its lavas, and the dark girdle of forest, which swells up over canyon-carved foothills, give it a grandeur equaled by hardly any American mountain. September 11th found the climbers of our party, S. F. Emmons, Frederick A. Clark, Albert B. Clark, Mr. Sisson, the pioneer guide of the region, and myself, 
mounted upon our mules, heading for the crater cone over rough rocks and among the stunted firs and pines which mark the upper limit of forest growth. The morning was cool and clear, with a fresh north wind sweeping around the volcano and bringing in its descent invigorating cold of the snow region. When we had gone as far as our mules could carry us, threading their difficult way among piles of lava, we dismounted and made up our packs of beds, instruments, food, and fuel for a three days trip and turned the animals over to George and John, our two muleteers, bade them good day, and with Sisson, who was to accompany us up the first descent, struck out on foot. Already above vegetation, we looked out over all the valley south and west, observing its arabesque of forest, meadow, and chaparral, the files of pines which struggled up almost to our feet, and just below us the volcano slope, strewn with red and brown wreck and patches of shrunken snowdrift. Our climb up the steep western crater slope was slow and tiresome, quite without risk or excitement. The footing, altogether of lodge debris, at times gave way provokingly and threw us out of balance. Once upon the spiry pinnacles which crowned the crater rim, a scene of wild power broke upon us. The round crater bowl, about a mile in diameter and nearly a thousand feet deep, lay beneath us. Its steep, shelving sides of shattered lava, mantled in places to the very bottom by fields of snow. We clambered along the edge toward Shasta and came to a place where for a thousand feet it was a mere blade of ice, sharpened by the snow into a thin, frail edge upon which we walked in cautious balance, a misstep likely to hurl us down into the chaos of lava blocks within the crater. Passing this, we reached the north edge of the rim, and from a rugged mound of shattered rock looked down into a gorge between us and the main Shasta. There, winding its huge body along, lay a glacier, riven with sharp, deep crevasses, yawning fifty or sixty feet wide, the blue hollows of their shadowed depth contrasting with the brilliant surfaces of ice. We studied its whole length from the far high Shasta crest down in winding course, deepening its canyon more and more as it extends, crowding past our crater cone, and at last terminating in bold ice billows and a wide belt of hilly moraine. The surface, over half of its length, was quite clean, but directly opposite us occurs a fine ice cascade. There its entire surface is cut with transverse crevasses, which have a general tendency to curve downward. And all this dislocation is accompanied by a freight of lava blocks which shoot down the canyon walls on either side, bounding out all over the glacier. In a later trip, while Watkins was making his photographic views, I climbed about, going to the edges of some crevasses and looking over into their blue vaults where icicles overhang and a whispered sound of water flow comes up faintly from beneath. From a point about midway across where I had climbed and rested upon the brink of an ice cliff, the glacier below me, breaking off into its wild pile of cascade blocks and serac, I looked down over all the lower flow, broken with billowy upheavals and bright with bristling spires of sunlit ice. Upon the right rose the great cone of Shasta, formed of chocolate-colored lavas, its skyline a single curved sweep of snow cut sharply against a deep blue sky. To the left, the precipices of the lesser cone rose to the altitude of 12,000 feet, their surfaces half-jagged ledges of lava and half-irregular sheets of ice. From my feet, the glacier sank rapidly between volcanic walls, and the shadow of the lesser cone fell in a dark band across the brilliantly lighted surface. Looking down its course, 
my eye ranged over sunny and shadowed zones of ice, over the gray boulder region of the terminal moraine, still lower along the former track of ancient and grander glaciers, and down upon undulating pine-clad foothills, descending in green steps, reaching out like promontories into the sea of plain which lay outspread nine thousand feet below, basking in the half-tropical sunshine, its checkered green fields and orchards, ripening their wheat and figs. Our little party separated, each going about his labor. The Clarks, with theodolite and barometer, were engaged on a pinnacle over on the western crater edge. Mr. Sisson, who had helped us thus far with a huge packload of wood, now said goodbye and was soon out of sight on his homeward tramp. Emmons and I geologized about the rim and interior slope, getting at last out of sight of one another. In mid-crater sprang up a sharp cone, several hundred feet high, composed of much shattered lava and indicating doubtless the very latest volcanic activity. At its base lay a small lakelet, frozen over with rough black ice. Far below us, cold gray banks and floating flocks of vapor began to drift and circle about the lava slopes, rising higher at sunset, till they quite enveloped us and, at times, shut out the view. Later we met for bivouac, spread our beds upon small debris under lee of a mass of rock on the rim, and built a little campfire, around which we sat closely. Clouds still eddied about us, opening now wide rifts of deep blue sky, and then glimpses of the Shasta summit glowing with evening light, and again views down the far earth where sunlight had long faded, leaving forest and field and village sunken in purple gloom. Through the old broken crater lip, over foreground of pallid ice and sharp black lava rocks, the clouds whirled away and, yawning wide, revealed an objectless expanse, out of which emerged dim mountain tops, for a moment seen, then veiled. Thus, in the midst of clouds, I found it extremely interesting to watch them and their habits. Drifting slowly across the crater bowl, I saw them float over and among the points of cindery lava, whose savage forms contrasted wonderfully with the infinite softness of their texture. I found it strange and suggestive that fields of perpetual snow should mantle the slopes of an old lava cauldron, that the very volcano's throat should be choked with a pure little lakelet and sealed with unmelting ice. That power of extremes, which held sway over lifeless nature before there were human hearts to experience its crush, expressed itself with poetic eloquence. Had Lowell been in our bivouac, I know he must have felt again the power of his own perfect figure of, quote, burned out craters healed with snow. It was a wild moment, wind smiting and shocks against the rock beside us, flaring up our little fire and whirling on with its cloud freight into the darkening crater gulf. We turned in, the Clarks together, Emmons and I in our fur bags. Upon cold stone, our bed was anything but comfortable, angular fragments of tracheite finding their way with great directness among our ribs and under shoulder blades, keeping us almost awake in that despairing semi-consciousness where dreams and thoughts tangle in tiresome confusion. Just after midnight, from sheer weariness, I arose, finding the sky cloudless, its whole black dome crowded with stars. A silver dawn over the slope of Shasta brightened till the moon sailed clear. Under its light, all the rugged topography came out with unnatural distinctness, every impression of height and depth greatly exaggerated. The empty crater lifted its rampart into the light, 
I could not tell which seemed most desolate, that dim moonlit rim with pallid snow mantle and gaunt crags, or the solid black shadow which was cast downward from southern walls, darkening half the bowl. From the silent air, every breath of wind or whisper of sound seemed frozen. Naked lava slopes and walls, the high gray body of Shasta with ridge and gorge, glacier and snowfield, all cold and still, under the icy brightness of the moon, produced a scene of arctic terribleness such as I had never imagined. I looked down, eagerly straining my eyes, through the solemn crater's lip, hoping to catch a glimpse of the lower world. But far below, hiding the earth, stretched out a level plain of cloud, upon which the light fell cold and gray, as upon a frozen ocean. I scrambled back to bed, and happily to sleep, a real sound, dreamless repose. We breakfasted some time after sunrise, and were soon under way, with packs on our shoulders. The day was brilliant and cloudless, the cold, still air full of life and inspiration. Through its clear blue, the Shasta Peak seemed elusively near, and we hurried down to the saddle which connects our cone with the peak and across the head of a small tributary glacier and up over the first debris slopes. It was a slow, tedious three hours climb over stones which lay as steeply as loose material possibly can, up to the base of a red tracheite spur, then on up a gorge and out upon a level mountain shoulder, where are considerable flats covered with deep ice. To the north, it overflows in a much crevassed tributary of the glacier we had studied below. Here we rested, and hung the barometer from Clark's tripod. The further ascent lies up a long scoria ridge of loose, red, pumiceous rock for seven or eight hundred feet, and then across another level step, curved with rugged ice, and up into a sort of corridor between two steep, much broken, and stained ridges. Here in the hollow are boiling sulfurous springs and hot earth. We sat down by them, eating our lunch in the lee of some stones. A short rapid climb brought us to the top, four hours and thirty minutes working time from our crater bivouac. There is no reason why anyone of sound wind and limb should not, after a little mountaineering practice, be able to make the Shasta climb. There is nowhere the shadow of danger and never a real piece of mountain climbing, climbing, I mean, with hands and feet, no scaling of walls or labor involving other qualities than simple muscular endurance. The fact that two young girls have made the ascent proves it a comparatively easy one. Indeed, I have never reached a corresponding altitude with so little labor and difficulty. Whoever visits California and wishes to depart from the beaten track of Yosemite scenes could not do better than to come to Strawberry Valley and get Mr. Sisson to pilot him up Shasta. When I ask myself today, what were the sensations on Shasta, they rendered themselves into three, geography, shadows, an uplifted isolation. After we had walked along a short curved ridge which forms the summit, representing, as I believe, all that remains of the original crater, it became my occupation to study the view. A singularly transparent air revealed every plain and peak till the earth's curve rolled them under remote horizons. The whole great disk of world outspread beneath, wore an aspect of glorious cheerfulness. The Cascade Range, a roll of blue forest land stretched northward, surmounted at intervals by volcanoes. The lower, like symmetrical Mount Pitt, bare and warm with rosy lava colors. Those farther north, lifting against the pale, horizon blue solid white cones upon which strong light rested with brilliance. It seemed incredible that we could see so far toward the Columbia River almost across the state of Oregon, 
but there stood Pitt, Jefferson, and the three sisters in unmistakable plainness. Northeast and east spread those great plains out of which rise low lava chains and a few small burned-out volcanoes, and there too were the group of Klamath and Goose Lakes lying in mid-plain glassing the deep upper violet. Farther and farther from our mountain base in that direction, the greenness of forest and meadow fades out into rich mellow brown, with warm cloudings of sienna over bare lava hills, and shades, as you reach the eastern limit, in pale ash and lavender and buff, where stretches of level land slope down over Madeline Plains into Nevada deserts. An unmistakable purity and delicacy of tint, with transparent air and paleness of tone, give all desert scenes the aspect of watercolor drawings. Even at this immense distance, I could see the gradual change from rich, warm hues of rocky slope or plain overspread with ripened vegetation out to the high, pale key of the desert. Southeast, the mountain spurs are smoothed into a broad glacis, densely overgrown with chaparral and ending in open groves around plains of yellow grass. A little farther begin the wild, canyon-curved piles of green mountains which represent the Sierras, and afar, towering over them 80 miles away, the lava dome of Lassen's Peak, standing up bold and fine. South, the Sacramento Canyon cuts down to unseen depths, its deep trough opening a view of the California Plain, a brown sunny expanse over which loom in vanishing perspective the coast range peaks. West of us, and quite around the semicircle of view, stretches a vast sea of ridges, chains, peaks, and sharp walls of canyons as wild and tumultuous as an ocean storm. Here and there, above the blue billows, rise snow crests and shaggy rock chains, but the topography is indistinguishable. With difficulty, I could trace for a short distance the Klamath Canyon course, recognizing Siskiyon Peaks, where Professor Brewer and I had been years before. But in that broad area, no further unraveling was possible. So high is Shasta, so dominant above the field of view, we looked over it all as upon a great shield which rose gently in all directions to the sky. Whichever way we turned, the great cone fell off from our feet in dizzying abruptness. We looked down steep slopes of Neve, on over shattered ice wreck, where glaciers roll over cliffs, and around the whole broad, massive base, curved deeply through its lava crusts in straight canyons. These flutings of ancient and grander glaciers are flanked by straight long moraines, for the most part bare, but reaching down part way into the forest. It is interesting to observe that those on the north and east, by greater massiveness and length, indicate that in former days the glacier distribution was related to the points of compass about as it is now. What volumes of geographical history lay in view? Old mountain uplift, volcanoes built upon the plain of fiery lava, the chill of ice and wearing force of torrent, written in glacier gorge and water-curved canyon. I think such vastness of prospect, now and then extremely valuable in itself, it forcibly widens one's conception of country, driving away such false notion of extent or narrowing idea of limitation as we get in living on lower plains. I never tire of overlooking these great wide fields, studying their rich variety and giving myself up to the expansion, which is the instant and lasting reward. In presence of these vast spaces, an all but unbounded outlook, the hours hurry by with singular swiftness. Minutes or miles are nothing. 
days and degrees seem best fitted for one's thoughts. So it came sooner than I could have believed that the sun neared its setting, sinking into a warm, bright stratum of air. The light stretched from north to south, reflecting itself with an equal depth all along the east until a perfect ring of soft, glowing rose edged the whole horizon. Over us, the ever-dark heaven hung near and flat. Light swept eastward across the earth, every uplift of hill ridge or solitary cone warm and bright with its reflections, and from each object upon the plains, far and near, streamed out dense, sharp shadows, slowly lengthening their intense images. We were far enough lifted above it all to lose the ordinary landscape impression and reach that extraordinary effect of black and bright topography as seen upon the moon through a telescope. Afar in the north, bars of blue shadow streamed out from the peaks, tracing themselves upon rosy air. All the eastern slope of Shasta was, of course, in dark shade. The gray glacier forms, broken ridges of stone and forest, all dim and fading. A long cone of cobalt blue, the shadow of Shasta, fell strongly defined over the bright plain, its apex darkening the earth a hundred miles away. As the sun sank, this gigantic spectral volcano rose on the warm sky till its darker form stood huge and terrible over the whole east. It was intensely distinct at the summit, just as faraway peaks, seen against the east and evening always are, and faded at base as it entered the stratum of earth mist. Grand and impressive, we had thought Shasta when studying in similar light from the plain. Infinitely more impressive was this phantom volcano as it stood overshadowing the land and slowly fading into night. Before quitting the ridge, Fred Clark and I climbed together out upon the highest pinnacle, a tracheite needle rising a few feet above the rest, and so small we could barely balance there together. But we stood a moment and waved the American flag, looking down over our shoulders 11,000 feet. A fierce wind blew from the southwest, coming in gusts of great force. Below, we could hear it beat surf-like upon the crags. We hurried down to the hot spring flat, and just over the curve of its southern descent made our bivouac. Even here, the wind howled merciless and cold. We turned to and built of lava blocks a square pen about two and a half feet high, filled the chinks with pebbles, and banked it with sand. I have seen other brownstone fronts more imposing than our Shasta home, but I have rarely felt more grateful to four walls than to that little six-by-six six pen. I have not forgotten that through its chinks, the sand and pebbles pelted us all night, nor was I oblivious when sudden gusts toppled over, here and there, a good-sized rock upon our feet. When we sat up for our cup of coffee, which Clark artistically concocted over the scanty and economical fire, the walls sheltered our backs, and for that we were thankful. Even if the wind had full sweep at our heads and stole the very draft from our lips, whirling it about north 40 east by compass in the form of an infinitesimal spray. The zephyr, as we courteously called it, had a fashion of dropping vertically out of the sky upon our fire, <laughs> leaving a clean hearth. For the space of a few moments after these meteorological jokes, there was a lively gathering of burning knots from among our legs and coats and blankets. There are times when the extreme of discomfort so overdoes itself as to extort a laugh and put one in the best of humor. This tempest descended to so many observed personal tricks altogether beneath the dignity of a reputable hurricane that at last it seemed to us a sort of furious burlesque. Not so the cold. That commanded entire respect. 
whether carefully abstracting our animal heat through the bed of gravel on which we lay, or brooding over us, hungry for those pleasant little waves of motion which, taking Tyndall for granted, radiated all night long in spite of wildcat bags from our unwilling particles. I abominate thermometers at such times. Not one of my set ever owned up the real state of things. Whenever I am nearly frozen and conscious of every indurated bone, that bland little instrument is sure to read 20 or 30 degrees above any unprejudiced estimate. Lying there and listening to the whispering sands that kindly drifted, ever adding to our cover, and speculating as to any further possible meteorological affliction, was but indifferent amusement, from which I escaped to a slumber of great industry. We lay like sardines, hoping to encourage animal heat, but with small success. The sunrise effect, with all its splendor, I find it convenient to leave to some future traveler. I shall be generous with him and say nothing of that hour of gold. It had occurred long before we awoke, and many precious minutes were consumed in united appeals to one another to get up and make coffee. It was horridly cold and uncomfortable where we were, but no one stirred. How natural it is under such circumstances to, quote, rather bear those ills we have than fly to others that we know not of. I lay musing on this, finding it singular that I should rather be there stiff and cold while my like-minded comrades appealed to me than to get up and comfort myself with campfire and breakfast. We severally awaited developments. At last, Clark gave up and made the fire, and he has left me in doubt whether he loved cold less or coffee more. Digging out our breakfast from drifted sand was pleasant enough, nor did we object to excavating the frozen shoes, but the mixture of disintegrated tracheite discovered among the sugar and the matter in which our brownstone front had blown over and flattened out the family provisions was received by us as calamity. However, we did justice to Clark's coffee and socially toasted our bits of meat while we chatted and ate zestfully portions not too freely brecciated with lava sand. I have been at times all but morbidly aware of the power of local attachment, finding it observably hard to turn the key on doors I have entered often and with pleasure. My own early home, though in other hands, holds its own against greater comfort, larger cheer. And a hundred times, when our little train moved away from grand old trees or willow-shaded springs by mountain camps, I have felt all the pathos of nomadism from the Aryan migration down. But as we shouldered our loads and took to the ice field, I looked back on our modest edifice and for the first time left my camp with gay relief. Elation of success and the vital mountain air lent us their quickening impulse. We tramped rapidly across the ice field and down a long spur of red tracheite, which extended in a southerly course around the head of a glacier. It was our purpose to descend the southern slope of the mountain to a camp which had been left there awaiting us. The declivity in that direction is more gentle than by our former trail and had besides the merit of lying open to our view almost from the very start. It was interesting, as we followed the red tracheite spur, to look down to our left upon Neve of the McLeod Glacier. From its very head, dislocation and crevices had begun, the whole mass moving away from the wall, leaving a deep gap between ice and rock. In its further descent, this glacier pours over such steep cascades and is so tortuous among the lava crags that we could only see its beginning. To avoid those great pyramidal masses, which sprung fully a thousand feet from the general flank of the mountain, we turned to the right and entered the head of one of those long, eroded glacier canyons which are scored down the slope. 
The ridges from both sides had poured in their freight of debris until the canyon was one mass of rock fragments of every conceivable size and shape. Here and there, considerable masses of ice and relics of former glaciers lay up and down the shaded sides, and, as we descended, occupied the whole broad bottom of the gorge. We congratulated ourselves when the steep upper debris slope was passed, and we found ourselves upon the wavy ice of the old glacier. Numerous streams flowed over its irregular face, losing themselves in the cracks and reappearing among the accumulation of boulders upon its surface. Here and there, glacier tables of considerable size rose above the general level, supported on slender ice columns. As the angle here was very steep, we amused ourselves by prying these off their pedestals with their alpine stalks and watching them slide down before us. More and more, the ice became burdened with rocks until at last it wholly disappeared under accumulation of moraine. Over this, for a half mile, we tramped, thinking the glacier ended, but in one or two depressions I again caught sight of the ice, which led me to believe that a very large portion of this rocky gorge may be underlaid by old glacial remains. Tramping over this unstable moraine, where melting ice had left the boulders in every state of uncertain equilibrium, we were greatly fatigued, and at last, the strain telling seriously on our legs, we climbed over a ridge to the left of our amphitheater into the next canyon, which was very broad and open, with gentle, undulating surface diversified by rock plateaus and fields of glacier sand. Here, by the margin of a little snow brook, and among piles of immense debris, Emmons and I sat down to lunch, and rested until our friends came up. A few scanty bunches of alpine plants began to deck the gray earth, and gradually to gather themselves in bits of open sward, here and there decorated with delicate flowers. Near one little spring meadow, we came upon gardens of a pale yellow flower with an agreeable aromatic perfume, and after another mile of straining on among erratic boulders and over the thick-strewed rock of the old moraines, we came to the advanced guard of the forest. Battle twisted and gnarled old specimens of trees of rugged, muscular trunk and scanty, irregular branch. They showed in every line and color a lifelong struggle against their enemies, the avalanche and cold. Gathering closer, they grew in groves, separated by long, open, grassy glades, the clumps of trees twisting their roots among the glacier blocks. For a long time, we followed the pathway of an avalanche. To the right and left of us, upon considerable heights, the trees were sound and whole, and preserved, even at their ripe age, the health of youth. But down the straight pathway of the valley, every tree had been swept away. The prostrate trunks, lying here and there, half buried in drifts of sand and rock. Here, over the whole surface, a fresh young growth of not more than six or seven years old has sprung up and begun a hopeless struggle for ground, which the snow claims for its own. Before us opened winding avenues through forest. Green meadows spread their pale, fresh herbage in sunny beauty. Along the little stream, which after a mile's musical cascades we knew flowed past camp, tender green plants and frail mountain flowers edged our pathway. All was still and peaceful, with the soft, brooding spirit of life. The groves were absolutely alive like ourselves, and drinking in the broad, affluent light in their silent, beautiful way. Back over sunny treetops, the great cone of rock and ice loomed in the cold blue, but we gladly turned away and let our hearts open to the gentle influence of our new world. There, at last, as we tramped over a knoll, were the mules 
dozing in sunshine or idling about among trees, and there that dear blue wreath floating up from our campfire and drifting softly among boughs of overhanging fir. I always feel a strange renewal of life when I come down from one of these climbs. They are with me points of departure more marked and powerful than I can account for upon any reasonable ground. In spite of any scientific labor or presence of fatigue, the lifeless region, with its savage elements of sky, ice, and rock, grasps one nature, and whether he will or no, compels it into a stern, strong accord. Then, as you come again into softer air and enter the comforting presence of trees and feel the grass under your feet, one fetter after another seems to unbind from your soul, leaving it free, joyous, grateful. End of chapter 11. Shasta. Chapter 12 of Mountaineering in the Sierra Nevada by Clarence King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 12 Shasta Flanks. There are certain women, I am informed, who place men under their spell without leaving them the melancholy satisfaction of understanding how the thing was done. They may have absolutely repulsive features and a pretty permanent absence of mind, without that charm of cheerful grace before which we are said to succumb, yet they manage to assume command of certain men. It is thus with mules. I have heard them called awkward and personally plain, nor is it denied that their disposition, though rich in individuality, lacks some measure of qualities which should endear them to humanity. Despite all this, and even more, they have a way of tenderly getting the better of us, and in the long run, absolutely enthroning themselves in our affections. Mystery as it is, I confess to its potent sway, long ago owning it beyond solution. Live on the intimate terms of brother explorer with your mule, be thoughtful for his welfare, and you, by and by, take an emotional start toward him, which will surprise you. You look into that reserved face, the embodiment of self-contained drollery, and begin to detect soft thought and tender feeling, and sometimes, as you cinch your saddle a little severely, the calm, reproachful visage will swing round and melt you with a single look. Nothing is left but to rub the velvet nose and loosen up the girth. When the mere brightness and gaiety of mountain life carries one away with their hilarious current, there is something in the meek and humble air of a lot of pack animals altogether chastening in its prompt effect. My 69er was one of those insidious beings who, within a week of our first meeting, asserted supremacy over my life and formed a silent partnership with my conscience. She was a chubby black mule, so sleek and rotund as distantly to suggest a pig on stilts. Upon the eye, which still remained, a cataract had begun to spread its dimming film. Her makeup was also defective in a weak pair of hind legs, which gave way suddenly in going up steep places. She was clumsy, and in rugged pathways would squander much time in the selection of her foothold. At these moments, when she deliberated, as I fancied needlessly long, I have very gently suggested with Spanish spur that it might be as well to start. The serious face then turned upon me, its mild eye looking into mine one long, earnest gaze as much to say, I love you and would spare you. Remember Balaam. I yielded. These animals are always of the opposition party. They reverse your wishes and from one year's end to another defy your best judgment. Yet I love them. 
and only in extreme moments go for them with a fence rail or a theodolite tripod. Nothing can be pleasanter than to ride them through the forest roads, chatting in a bright company, and catching glimpses of far, quiet scenery framed by the long, furry ears. So we thought, on that sunny morning when we left Sissons, starting ahead of wagons and pack animals, and riding out into the woodland on our trip around Shasta, a march of a hundred miles, with many proposed side excursions into the mountain. The California haze had again enveloped Shasta, this time nearly obscuring it. In a forest along the southeast base, we came upon the stream flowing from McLeod Glacier, its cold waters milky white with fine sandy sediment. Such dense and penetrable fields of chaparral covered the south foothills that we were only able to fight our way through limited parts, getting, however, a clear idea of lava flows and topography. Farther east, the plains rise to 7,000 feet, and fine wooded ridges sweep down from Shasta, inviting approach. While Bunger and Watkins camped to make studies and negatives of the peak, Fred Clark and I packed one mule with a week's provisions, and mounting our saddle animals, struck off into the dark silent forest. It was a steep climb of eight or ten miles up tree-covered ridges and among outcrops of gray tracheite, nearly every foot showing more or less evidence of glacial action. Long trains of morainal rocks, upon which large forest trees seemed satisfied to grow, great rough regions of terminal rubbish with enclosed patches of level earth, commonly grass-grown and picturesque, it was sunset before we came upon water, and then it flowed a thousand feet below us in the bottom of a sharp, narrow canyon, cut abruptly down in what seemed glacial debris. I thought it unwise to take our mules down its steep wall if there were any camp spot higher up in the opener head of the canyon, and went off on foot to climb the wooded moraine still farther, hoping to come upon a bit of alpine sward with icy pool or even upon a spring. When up between two and three hundred feet, the trees became less and less frequent. Rugged trains of stone and glacier-scored rock in places covering the spurs. I could now overlook the snow amphitheater, which opened vast and shadowy above. Not a sign of vegetation enlivened its stony bed. The icy brook flowed between slopes of debris. At my feet, a tracheite ridge narrowed the stream with a tortuous bed and led it to the edge of a 500-feet cliff, over which poured a graceful cascade. Finding no camp spot there, I turned northward and made a detour through deep woods, by and by coming back to Clark. We faced the necessity, and by dark, were snugly camped in the wild canyon bottom. It was one of the loneliest bivouacs of my life. Shut in by high, dark walls, a few clustered trees growing here and there, others which floods had undermined, lying prostrate, rough boulders thrown about, an icy stream hurrying by, and chilly winds coming down from the height, against which our blankets only half defended us. Our excursion next day was south and west, across high, scantily wooded moraines, till we came to the deep canyon of the McLeod Glacier. I describe this gorge as it is one of several similar, all peculiar, to Shasta. We had climbed to a point about 10,000 feet above the sea, and were upon the eastern edge of a canyon of 11 or 1,200 feet depth. From the very crest of the Shasta, with here and there a few patches of snow, a long and remarkably even debris slope swept down. It seemed as if these small pieces of tracheite formed a great part of the region, for to the very bottom our canyon walls were worked out of it. A half mile below us, the left bank was curiously eroded by side streams, resulting in a family of pillars from one to seven hundred feet high, each capped 
with some hard lava boulder which had protected the soft debris beneath from weathering. From its lofty neve, the McLeod Glacier descended over rugged slopes in one long cascade to a little above our station, where it impinged against a great rock buttress and turned sharply from the south wall towards us, rounding over in a great, solid ice dome eight or nine hundred feet high. For a mile farther, a huge accumulation looking like a river of debris cumbered the bottom. Here and there, on close scrutiny, we found it to be pierced with caverns, whose ice walls showed that the glacier underlaid all this vast amount of stone. Boulders rattled continually from the upper glacier and down both canyon walls, increasing the already great burden. Along both sides were evidences of motion in the lateral moraine embankments and a very perceptible rounding up of terminal ramparts from which, in white torrent, poured the subglacial brook. It is instructive to consider what an amount of freighting labor the shrunken ice stream has to perform besides dragging its own vast weight along. In descending Shasta, we had found glacial ice which evidently, for a mile or more, deeply underlaid a mass of rock similar to this. It is one of the curiosities of Mount Shasta that such great bulk of ice should be buried and in large part preserved by loads of rock fragments. Fine contrasts of color were afforded high up among the Serac by a combination of blue ice and red lavas. We hammered and surveyed here for half the day, then descended to our mules, who bore us eagerly back to their home, our weird little canyon camp. A pleasant day's march, altogether in woods and over glacial ridges, during which not a half hour passed without opening views of the cone, brought us high on the northern slope, at the upper forest limit, in a region of barren avalanche tracks and immense moraines. Between those great straight ridges, which jut almost parallel from the volcano's base, are wide, shelving valleys, the pathways of extinct glaciers. And here the forest, although it must once have obtained foothold, has been uprooted and swept away before powerful avalanches, crushed in up-piled trunks in sad wreck, marking spots where the snow rush stopped. Two brooks, separated by a wide, gently rounding zone of drift, flowed down through the glacier valley, which opened directly in front of our camp. Early next morning, Clark and I made up a bag of lunch, shouldered our instruments, and set out for a day on the glacier. Our slow, laborious ascent of the valley was not altogether uninteresting. Constant views obtained of moraines on either side gave us much pleasure and study. It was instructive to observe that the bases of their structure were solid floors of lava, upon which, in rude though secure masonry, were piled embankments not less than half a mile wide and 400 feet high. Among the huge rocks which formed the upper structure, the tree forms were peculiar. Apparently, every tree had made an effort to fill some gap and round out the smooth general surface. No matter how deeply twisted between high boulders, the branches spread themselves out in a continuous dense mat stretching from stone to stone. It was only rarely, and in the less elevated parts of the moraine, that we could see a trunk. The whole effect was of a causeway of rock overgrown by some dense green vine. Similar patches of stunted trees grew here and there over the bottom of our broad amphitheater. Oftentimes we threaded our way among dense thickets of pines, never over six or eight feet in height, having trunks often two and three feet in diameter, and more than once we walked over their tops, our feet sinking but two or three inches into the dense mat of foliage. Here and there, half buried in the drift, 
we came across the tall, noble trunks of avalanche-killed trees. In comparing their straight symmetrical growth with the singularly matted condition of the living dwarfed trees, I find the indication of a great climatic change. Not only are the present avalanches too great to permit their growth, but the violent cold winds which drift over this region bend down the young trees to such an extent that there are no longer tall, normal specimens. Around the upper limits of arborescent vegetation, we pass some most enchanting spots. Groves, not over eight feet in height, of large trees whose white trunks and interwoven boughs formed a colonnade, over which stretched thick, living thatch. Under these strange galleries, we walked upon soft, velvety turf and an elastic cushion of pine needles. Nor could we resist the temptation of lying down here to rest beneath the dense roof. As we looked back, charming little vistas opened between the old and dwarfed stems. In one direction, we could see the moraine with its long graded slope and variegated green and brown surface. In another, the open pathway of the old glacier, worn deeper and deeper between lofty, forest-clad spurs, and up to the great snow mass above us, with its slender peak in the heavens, looking down upon magnificent sweep of Neve. Only the strong desire for glaciers led us away from these delightful groves. A short tramp over sand and boulders brought us to the foot of a broad, irregular, terminal moraine. Two or three milky cascades poured out from under the great boulder region and united to form two important streams. We followed one of these in our climb up the moraine, and after an hour's hard work, found ourselves upon an immense pile of lava blocks from which we could overlook the whole. In a regular curve, it continues not less than three miles around the end of the glacier, and a note place that I saw was less than half a mile in width. Where we had attacked it, the width cannot be less than a mile, and the portion over which we had climbed must reach a thickness of five or six hundred feet. About half a mile above us, though but little lifted from our level, undulating hillocks of ice mark the division between glacier and moraine. Above that, it stretched in uninterrupted white fields. The moraine in every direction extended in singularly abrupt hills separated by deep, irregular pits and basins of a hundred and more feet deep. As we climbed on, the footing became more and more insecure, piles of rock giving way under our weight. Before long, we came to a region of circular, funnel-shaped craters, where evidently the underlying glacier had melted out and a whole freight of boulders fallen in with a rush. Around the edges of these horrible traps, we threaded our way with extreme caution. Now and then a boulder dislodging under our feet, rolled down into these pits, and many tons would settle out of sight. Altogether, it was the most dangerous kind of climbing I have ever seen. You were never sure of your foothold. More than once, when crossing a comparatively smooth, level boulder field, they began to sink underneath us, and we sprang on from stone to stone while the great mass caved and sank slowly behind us. At times, while making our way over solid-seeming stretches, the sound of a deep, subglacial stream flowing far beneath us came up faint and muffled through the chinks of the rock. This sort of music is not encouraging to the nerves. To the siren babble of Mountain Brook is added all the tragic nearness of death. We looked far and wide in hope of some solid region which should lead us up to the ice, but it was all alike, and we hurried on, the rocks settling and sinking beneath our tread, until we made our way to its edge, and climbed with relief upon its hard white surface. After we had gained the height of a hundred feet, 
climbing up a comparatively smooth slope between brooks which flowed over it, a look back gave a more correct idea of the general billowy character of our moraine, and here and there in its deeper indentations we could detect the underlying ice. It is then here as upon the McLeod Glacier. For at least a mile's width, the whole lower zone is buried under accumulation of morainal matter. Instead of ending, like most Swiss glaciers, this ice wastes chiefly in contact with the ground, and when considerable caverns are formed, the overlying moraine crushes its way through the rotten roof making the funnels we had seen. Thankful that we had not assisted at one of these engulfments, we scrambled on up the smooth, roof-like slope, steadying our ascent by the tripod legs used as alpine stock. When we had climbed perhaps a thousand feet, the surface angle became somewhat gentler, and we were able to overlook before us the whole broad incline up to the very peak. For a mile or a mile and a half, the sharp blue edges of crevasses were apparent here and there, yawning widely for the length of a thousand feet and at other places intersecting each other confusedly, resulting in piled-up masses of shattered ice. We were charmed to enter this wild region and hurried to the edge of an immense chasm it could hardly have been less than a thousand or twelve hundred feet in length. The solid white wall of the opposite side, sixty feet over, fell smooth and vertical for a hundred feet or more, where rough wedged blocks and bridges of clear blue ice stretched from wall to wall. From these and from numerous overhanging shelves hung the long crystal threads of icicles, and beyond dark and impenetrable, opened ice caverns of unknown limit. We cautiously walked along this brink, examining with deep interest all the lines of stratification and veining and the strange succession of views down into the fractured regions below. I had the greatest desire to be let down with a rope and make my way among these pillars and bridges of ice, but our little twenty feet of slender rope forbade the attempt. Farther up, the crevasses walled us about more and more. At last, we got into a region where they cut into one another, breaking the whole glacier body into a confused pile of ice blocks. Here we had great difficulty in seeing our way for more than a very few feet, and were constantly obliged to climb to the top of some dangerous block to get an outlook, and before long, instead of a plain with here and there a crevasse, we were in a mass of crevasses separated by only thin and dangerous blades of ice. Still, we pushed on, tied together with our short line, jumping over pits and chasms, holding our breath over slender snow ridges, and beginning to think the work serious. We climbed an ice crag together. All around rose strange, sharp forms. Below, in every direction, yawned narrow cuts, caves trimmed with long stalactites of ice, walls ornamented with crystal pilasters, and dark blue grottoes opening down into deeper and more gloomy chambers, as silent and cold as graves. Far above, the summit rose white and symmetrical, its skyline sweeping down sharp against the blue. Below, over ice wreck and frozen waves, opened the deep valley of camp, leading our vision down to distant forest slopes. We were in the middle of a vast, convex glacier surface, which embraced the curve of Shasta for four miles around, and at least five on the slope line, ice stretching in every direction and actually bounding the view on all sides except where we looked down. The idea of a mountain glacier, formed from Swiss or Indian views, is always of a stream of ice walled in by more or less lofty ridges. Here, 
a great curved cover of ice flows down the conical surface of a volcano without lateral walls. A few lava pinnacles and inconspicuous piles of debris separating it from the next glacier, but they were unseen from our point. Sharp, white profiles met the sky. It became evident we could go no further in the old direction, and we at once set about retracing our steps, but in the labyrinth soon lost the barely discernible tracks and never refound them. Whichever way we turned, impassable gulfs opened before us, but just a little way to the right or left it seemed safe and traversable. At last I got provoked at the ill luck and suggested to Clark that we might with advantage take a brief intermission for lunch, feeling that a lately quieted stomach is the best defense for nerves. So when we got into a pleasant open spot where the glacier became for a little way smooth and level, we sat down, leisurely enjoying our repast. We saw a possible way out of our difficulty and sat some time chatting pleasantly. When there was no more lunch, we started again, and only three steps away came upon a narrow crack edged by sharp ice jaws. There was something noticeable in the hollow, bottomless darkness seen through it which arrested us, and when we had jumped across to the other side, both knelt and looked into its depths. We saw a large domed grotto, walled in with shattered ice and arched over by a roof of frozen snow so thin that the light came through quite easily. The middle of this dome overhung a terrible abyss. A block of ice thrown in fell from ledge to ledge, echoing back its stroke fainter and fainter. We had unconsciously sat for twenty minutes, lunching and laughing on the thin roof, with only a few inches of frozen snow to hold us up over that still, deep grave. A noonday sun rapidly melting its surface, the warmth of our person slowly thawing it, and both of us playfully drumming the frail crest with our tripod legs. We looked at one another and agreed that we had lost confidence in glaciers. Splendid rifts now opened to north of us, with slant sunshine lighting up one side in vivid contrast with the cold shadowed wall. We greatly enjoyed a tall precipice with a gaping crevasse at its base and found real pleasure in the north edge of the great ice field, whither we now turned. A low moraine, with here and there a mass of rock which might be solid, flanked the glacier, but was separated from it by a deeply melted crevasse, opening irregular caverns along the wall down under the very glacier body. We were some time searching a point where this gulf might safely be crossed. A thin tongue of ice, sharpened by melting to a mere blade, jutted from the solid glacier over to the moraine, offering us a passage of some danger and much interest. We edged our way along, astride its crest, until a good spring carried us over a final crevasse and up upon the moraine, which we found to be dangerously built up of honeycombed ice and boulders. The same perilous sinks and holes surrounded us and alternated with hollow archways over subterranean streams. It was a relief, after an hour's labor, to find ourselves on solid lava, although the ridge which proved to be a chain of old craters, was one of the most dreary reaches I've ever seen. In the evidence of glacier motion, there had seemed a form of life, but here among silent, rigid crater rims and stark fields of volcanic sand, we walked upon ground lifeless and lonely beyond description, a frozen desert at 9,000 feet altitude. Among the huge, rude forms of lava we tramped along, happy when the tracks of mountain sheep suggested former explorers, and pleased if a snowbank under rock shadow gave birth to spring or pool. 
but the severe impression of arctic dreariness passed off when reaching a rim we looked over and down upon the volcano's north foot a superb sweep of forest country waved with ridgy flow of lava and gracefully curved moraines afar off the wide sunny shasta valley dotted with miniature volcanoes and checked with the yellow and green of grain and garden spread pleasantly away to the north bounded by klamath hills and horizoned by the blue rank of siskion mountains to our left the cone slope stretched away to sissons the sharp form of the black cone rising in the gap between shasta and scott mountain here again the tremendous contrast between lava and ice about us and that lowly expanse of ranches and verdure impressed anew its peculiar force. We tramped on along the glacier edge, over rough ridges and slopes of old moraine, rounding at last the ice terminus, and crossing the valley to camp, where our three mules welcomed us with friendly discord. A day's march over forest-covered moraines and through open glades, brought us to the main camp at Sheep Rock, uniting us with our friends. The heavier air of this lower level soothed us into a pleasant laziness which lasted over Sunday, resting our strained muscles and opening the heart anew to human and sacred influence. If we are sometimes at pain with realizing within what narrow range of latitude mankind reaches finer development, how short a step it is from tropical absence of spiritual life to dull, boreal stupidity, it is added humiliation to experience our marked limitation in altitude. At 14,000 feet, little is left me but bodily appetite and impression of sense. The habit of scientific observation which in time becomes one of the involuntary processes, goes on, as do heartbeat and breathing. A certain general awe overshadows the mind. But on descending again to lowlands, one after another, the whole riches of the human organization come back with delicious freshness. Something of this must account for my delight in finding the family of Protom a half-Cherokee mountaineer, known hereabouts as Protum, camped near us. Protum was a barbarian by choice, and united all the wilder instincts with a domestic passion worthy his Caucasian ancestor, and quite charming in its childlike manifestation. Protum Mare, an obese digger woman, so evidently avoided us that I respected her feelings and never once visited their bivouac, although the flutter of gaudy rags and that picturesque squalor of which she and the campfire were center and soul sorely tempted me. The old man and his four little barefoot girls, if not actually familiar, were more than sociable and spent much time with us. The elder three, ranging from eight to twelve, were shy and timid as little quails, dodging about and scampering off to some hiding place when I strove to introduce myself through the medium of such massive sweet cakes as our William produced. Not so the little six-year-old Clarissa, who in all frankness met my advances and repaid me for the cookies she silently devoured by gentlest and most fascinating smiles. A stained and earth-hued flower sack, rudely gathered into a band, was her skirt, and confined the little, long-sleeved, pink calico sack. From out a voluminous sunbonnet with long cape shone the chubby face of my little friend. For all she was so young and charmingly small, Clarissa was woman rather than child. She took entire care of herself, and prowled about in a self-contained way, making studies and observations with ludicrous gravity. Early mornings, she came with slow matronly gait down to the horse trough, and rolling up her sleeves, laid aside the huge sunbonnet, washed her face and hands, wiping them on her petticoat, 
and arranged her jetty Indian hair with the quiet unconsciousness of fifty years. Her good morning nod, with a reserved yet affectionate smile, put me in happiness for the day, and when as I strolled about, she overtook me and placed her little hand in mine, looking up with fearless, quiet confidence. I measured step with her, and we held sweet chats about squirrels and field mice. But I thought her most charming when she brought her father down to our campfire after supper and, alternately on his knee or mine, listened to our stories and wound a soft little arm about my neck. The twilight passed agreeably thus, Clarissa gradually paying less and less attention to our yarns, till she pulled the skirts of my cavalry coat over her and, curling up on my lap, laid her dear little head on my breast, smiled, gaped, rubbed with plump knuckles the blinking eyes, dozed, and at last sank into a deep sleep. I can even now see old Protum draw an explanatory map on the ground his moccasin had smoothed, and go on with his story of bear fight or wolf trap, illustrating by singularly apt gesture every trait and motion of the animal he described, while firelight warmed the brown skin and ruddy cheek of my little charge and flickered on her soft black hair. The last bear story of an evening being ended, Protum took from me Clarissa, whose single yawn and pretty bewilderment subsided in a second, leaving her sound asleep on the buckskin shoulder of her father. About halfway between Sheep Rock and the Snow Line, extensive eruptions of basalt have occurred, deluging the lower slopes and flowing in gently inclined fields and streams down through Shasta Valley for many miles. The surface of this basalt country is singularly diversified. Rising above its general level are numerous domes, some of them smoothly arched over with rock, others perforated at the top, and more broken in circular parapets. The origin of these singular blisters is probably simple. Overflowing former tracheite fields, the basalt swept down, covering a series of pools and brooks, the water converted into steam blew up the viscous rock in such forms as we find. Here and there, the basalt surface opens in circular orifices into which you may look a hundred feet or more. In 1863, in company with Professor Brewer, I visited this very region, and we were then shown an interesting tubular cavern lying directly under the surface of a lava plain. Mr. Palmer and I revisited the spot, and having tied our mules, descended through a circular hole to the cavern's mouth. An archway of black lava, sixty feet wide by eighty high, with a floor of lava sand and rough boulders, led under the basalt in a northerly direction, preserving an incline not more than the gentle slope of the country. Our roof overhead could hardly have been more than twenty or thirty feet thick. We followed the cavern, which was a comparatively regular tube, for half or three-quarters of a mile. Now and then the roof would open up in larger chambers, and the floor be cumbered with huge piles of lava over which we scrambled, sometimes nearly reaching the ceiling. Fresh lava froth and smooth blister holes lined the sides. Innumerable bats and owls on silent wing floated by our candles, fanning an air singularly still and dense. After a cautious scramble over a long pile of immense basalt blocks, we came to the end of the cave and sat down upon piles of debris. We then repeated an experiment, formerly made by Brewer and myself, of blowing out our candle to observe the intense darkness, then firing a pistol that we might hear its dull, muffled explosion. The formation of this cave, as explained in Professor Whitney's geological report, is this. A basalt stream, flowing down from Shasta, cooled and hardened upon the surface, while within, the mass remained molten and fluid. 
from simple pressure the lava burst out at the lower end and flowing forth left an empty tube. Wonderfully fresh and recent, the whole confused rock walls appeared, and we felt, as we walked and climbed back to the opening and to daylight, as if we had been allowed to travel back into the volcano age. One more view of Shasta, obtained a few days later from Wells Ranch on the Eureka Road, seems worthy of mention. From here, the cone and side crater are in line, making a single symmetrical form with broad broken summit, singularly like Cotopaxi. You look over green meadows and cultivated fields. Beyond is a chain of little volcanoes girdling Shasta's foot, for the most part bare and yellow, but clouded in places with dark forest, which a little farther up mantles the broad, grand cone and sweeps up over ridge and canyon to alpine heights of rock and ice. Strange and splendid is the evening effect from here when shadow over base and light upon summit divide the vast pile into two zones of blue-purple and red-gold. We watch the colors fade and the peak recede farther and dimmer among darkness and stars. End of chapter 12 Shasta Flanks Chapter 13 of Mountaineering in the Sierra Nevada by Clarence King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 13 Mount Whitney. There lay between Carson and Mount Whitney a ride of 280 miles along the east base of the Sierra. Stage driving, like other exact professions, gathers among its followers certain types of men and manners either by some mode of natural selection, or else after a Darwinian way developing one set of traits to the exclusion of others. However interesting it might be to investigate the molding power of whip and reins, or to discover what measure of coachman there is latent in every one of us, it cannot be questioned that the characters of drivers do resemble one another in surprising degree, that ostentatious silence and self-contained way of ignoring one's presence on the box for the first half hour, the tragicomic, just audible undertone in which they remonstrate with the swing team, and such single refrain of obsolete song as they drone and drone a hundred times, may be observed on every coach from San Diego to Montana. So I found it natural enough that the driver, my sole companion from Carson to Aurora, should sit for the first hour in a silence etiquette forbade me to violate. His team, by strict attention to their duties, must have left his mind quite free, and I saw symptoms of suppressed social ability within forty miles of our departure. The nine-mile house, if my memory serves, was his landmark for taciturnity, for soon after passing it, he began to skirmish along a sort of picket line of conversation. To the wheel mares, he remarked, Hot gals, ain't it, though? And to his off-leader, who strained wild eyes in every direction for something to become excited about, Look at him, Dixie, wouldn't you like a rabbit to shy at? With a true driver's pride in reading men, he scanned me from boots to barometer, and at last, to my immense delight, said, with the air of throwing his hat into a ring, What mountain was you going down to measure? Had he inquired after my grandfather by his first name, I could not have been more surprised. At once I told him the plain truth and waited for further developments. But like an indifferent shot who drives centers on a first trial, he proposed not to endanger his reputation for infallibility by other ventures, and withdrew again to that conspicuous stupidity which coachmen and Buddhists alike delight in. Left to myself, I spent hours in looking out over the desert and up along that bold front of Sierra which rose on our right from the sage plains of Carson Valley 
up through ramparts of pine land to summits of rock and ravines with shrunken snowbanks. So as far as Aurora, I remember little worth describing. Sierras, or outlying volcanic foothills, bound the west. About our road are desert plains and rolling sage-clad hills, fresh light olive at this June season, and softly sloping in long glacis down to wide, impressive levels. Green valleys and cultivated farms margin the Carson and Walker rivers. Sierras are not lofty enough to be grand, desert too gentle and overspread with sage to be terrible, yet the pale high key of all its colors and singular aerial brilliancy lend an otherwise dreary enough picture the charm as I once before said, of watercolor drawings. There is no perspective under this fierce white light. In midday, intensely sharp reflections glare from hill and valley, except where the shadow of passing clouds spreads cool and blue over olive slopes. Alas for Aurora, once so active and bustling with silver mines and its almost daily murder, 26 whiskey hells, and two vigilance committees grace those days of prosperity and mirthful gallows, of stock board and the gay delirium of speculation. Now her sad streets are lined with closed doors. A painful silence broods over quartz mills, and through the whole deserted town one perceives that melancholy security of human life, which is hereabouts one of the pathetic symptoms of bankruptcy. The boys have gone off to merrily shoot one another somewhere else, leaving poor Aurora in the hands of a sort of coroner's jury who gather nightly at the one saloon and hold dreary inquest over departed enterprise. My landlord's tread echoed through a large empty hotel, and when I responded to his call for lunch, the silentest of girls became medium between me and a Chinaman who gazed sad-eyed through his kitchen door, as in pity for one who must choose between starving and his own cookery. But I have always felt it unpardonable egotism for a traveler to force the reader into sharing with him the inevitable miseries of roadside food. Whatever merit there may be in locking this prandial grief fast from public view, I feel myself entitled to, in a high degree, for I told it in my power to describe the most revolting cuisine on the planet, and yet I refrain. From Aurora, my road, still parallel with the mountains, though now hidden from them by banks of volcanic hills, climbed a long, wearisome slope, from whose summit a glorious panorama of snowy sierras lay before us. From our feet, steep declivities sloped 2,000 feet to the level of a wide desert basin, bounded upon the west by long ranks of high white peaks and otherwise walled in by chains of volcanic hills, smooth with dull sage flanks, and yet varied here and there by outcropping formations of eruptive rocks and dusky cedar forests. Just at the Sierra foot, surrounded by bare gray volcanoes and reaches of ashen plain, lies Mono Lake, a broad oval darkened along its farther shore by reflecting the shadowed mountains and pale tranquil blue where among light desert levels it mirrors the silken softness of sky and cloud. Flocks of pelicans, high against the sky, floated in slow wheeling flight, reflecting the sun from white wings and turning were lost in the blue to gleam out again like flakes of snow. The eye ranges over strange, forbidding hill forms and leagues of desert from which no familiarity can ever banish suggestions of death. Traced along boundary hills, straight terraces of an ancient beach indicate former water levels, and afar in the Sierra, great empty gorges, glacier burnished and moraine flanked, lead up to an amphitheater of rock once white with neve. I recognize the old familiar summits, Mount Ritter, Lyell, Dana, and that firm peak with tightened strength and brow so square and solid, it seems altogether natural we should have named it for California's statesman, John Connus. 
we rumbled down hill and out upon the desert, plodding until evening through sand and over rocky, cedar-wooded spurs, at last crossing adobe meadows where were settlements and a herd of Spanish cattle which had escaped the drought of California, and now marched, northward bound, for Montana. Frowning volcanic hills flanked our road as evening wore on, lifting dark forms against a sky singularly pale and luminous. Afar, we caught glimpses of the dark swelling Sierra wave thrusting up star-neighboring peaks and then descending into hollows among lava mounds and found ourselves completely shut in. A night at the hot springs of Partswick was notably free from anything which may be recounted. Morning found me waiting alone on the hotel veranda, and I suppose the luxuries of the establishment must have left a stamp of melancholy upon my face, for the little solemn driver who drew up his vehicle at the door said in a tone of condolence, The hearse is ready. Stages, drivers, and teams had been successively worse as I journeyed southward. This little old specimen, by whose side I sat from Partswick to Independence, ought to be accepted, and I should neglect a duty were I not to portray one, at least, of his traits. He was a musical old fellow, and given to chanting in low tones songs, sometimes pathetic, often sentimental, but in every case preserved by him in most fragmentary recollection. Such singing suffered, too, from the necessary and frequent interruption of driving. The same breath, quavering and cracked melody, and tossing some neatly rounded oath or horse phrase at off or near Wheeler, catching up and into the refrain again in time to satisfy his musical requirements. All the morning he had warned me most impressively to count myself favored if a certain bridge over Bishop's Creek should not sink under us and cast me upon wild waters. Rightly estimating my friend, I was not surprised when we reached the spot to find a good solid structure bridging a narrow creek not more than four feet deep. As we rolled on down Owens Valley, he sang, chatted, and drove, in a manner which showed him capable of three distinct yet simultaneous mental processes. I follow his words as nearly as memory serves. That creek, sir, was six feet deep. What the devil you shying at, you cursed Mustang? Come up onto that little green grave. Yes, seven feet we fell in. Swimming wouldn't have saved us. You, Bailey, what are you doing on the hill? On the flowing veil. And what's more, we couldn't have crawled up that bank. No how. My own dear Lily Dale. And you'd kick over them traces, would you? Keep your doggone neck up snub against that collar and take that. We'd drown, sir. Drown, sure as thunder. In the place where the violets grow. Desert hills and low mountain gateways, opening views of vast sterile plains no longer form our eastern outlook. The White Mountains, a lofty, barren chain vying with the Sierras in altitude, rose in splendid rank and stretched southeast parallel with the Great Range. Down the broad intermediate trough flows Owens River, alternately through expanses of natural meadow and desolate reaches of sage. The Sierra, as we traveled southward, grew bolder and bolder, strong granite spurs plunging steeply down to the desert. Above, the mountain sculpture grew grander and grander until forms wild and rugged as the Alps stretched on in dense ranks as far as the eye could reach. More and more, the granite came out in all its strength. Less and less, soil covered the slopes. Groves of pine became rarer, and sharp, rugged buttresses advance boldly to the plain. Here and there a canyon gate between rough granite pyramids and flanked by huge moraines opened its savage gallery back among peaks. Even around summits there was but little snow, and the stream, which at short intervals flowed from the mountain foot, traversing the plains, 
were sunken far below their ordinary volume. The mountain forms and mode of sculpture of the opposite ranges are altogether different. The white and inyo chains formed chiefly of uplifted sedimentary beds are largely covered with soil, and wherever the solid rock is exposed, its easily traced strata planes and soft wooded surface combined in producing a general aspect of breadth and smoothness, while the Sierra, here more than anywhere else, hold up a front of solid stone carved into the most intricate and highly ornamental forms. Vast aguilles, trimmed from summit to base with a line of slender minarets, huge broad domes, deeply fluted and surmounted with tall obelisks, and everywhere the greatest profusion of bristling points. From the base of each range, a long sloping talus descends gently to the river, and here and there, bursting up through Sierra foothills, rise the red and black forms of recent volcanoes as regular and barren as if cooled but yesterday. I had reason for not regretting my departure from the Inyo house at Independence next morning before sunrise, and when a young woman in an elaborate brown calico, copied evidently from some imperial evening toilet, pertly demanded my place by the driver, adding that she was not one of the inside kind, I willingly yielded and made myself contented on the back seat alone. Presently, however, a companion came to me in the person of a middle-aged Spanish donna, clad altogether in black, with a shawl worn over her head after the manner of a mantilla. When it began to rain violently and beat upon that brown calico, I made bold to offer the young woman my sheltered place, but she gaily declined, averring herself not made of sugar. So the donna and I shared my great coat across our laps, and established relations of civility, though she spoke no English, and I only that little Spanish, so much more embarrassing than none. In her smile, in her large, soft eyes, in that tinge of Castilian blood which shone red warm through olive cheek, I saw the signs of a race blessed with sturdier health than ours, with snowy hair growing low on a massive forehead, and just a glimpse now and then of large gold beads through a white handkerchief about her throat, she seemed to me a charming picture, though perhaps her fine looks gained something by contrasting with the sickly girl in front, whose pallor and cough could have not meant less than the pre-tubercular state. Clouds covered the mountains on either hand, leaving me only ranches and people to observe. May I be forgiven, if I am wrong, in accounting for the late improvement of political tone in Tuolme by the presence here of so large a share of her most degraded citizens, people whose faces and dress and life and manners are sadder than any possibilities held up to us by Darwin. My long ride ended in a few hours at Lone Pine, where from the hotel window, I watched a dark blue mass of storm which covered and veiled the region where I knew my goal, the Whitney Summit, must stand. For two days, storm curtains hung low about Sierra Base, their vapor banks, dark with fringes of shower, at times drifted out over Lone Pine and quenched a thirsty earth. On the third afternoon, blue sky shone through rifts overhead and now and then a single peak, dashed with broken sunshine, rose for a moment over rolling clouds which swelled above it, again like huge billows. About an hour before sunset, the storm began rapidly to sink into level fold over which, in clear yellow light, emerged cloud-compelling peaks. The liberated sun poured down shafts of light piercing the mist which now in locks of gold and gray blew about the mountain heads in wonderful splendor. How deep and solemn a blue filled the canyon depths! What passion of light glowed around the summits! With delight I watched them one after another, 
fading till only the sharp, terrible crest of Whitney, still red with reflected light from the long, sunken sun, showed bright and glorious above the whole Sierra. Upon observing the topography, I saw that one bold spur advanced from Mount Whitney to the plain. On either side of it, profound canyons opened back to the summit. I remembered the impossibility of making a climb up those northern precipices and at once chose the more southern gorge. Next morning, we set out on horseback for the mountain base, 12 miles across plains and through an outlying range of hills. My companion for the trip was Paul Pinson, as tough and plucky a mountaineer as France ever sent us, who consented readily to follow me. Jose, the mild-mannered and grinning Mexican boy who rode with us, was to remain in care of our animals at the foothills where we made the climb. I left a green barometer to be observed at Lone Pine and carried my short high mountain instrument by the same excellent maker. Gauzy mists again enveloped the Sierra, leaving us free minds to enjoy a ride of which the very first mile supplied me food for days of thought. The American residents of Lone Pine outskirts live in a homeless fashion, Sullen, almost arrogant neglect stares out from the open doors. There is no attempt at grace, no memory of comfort, no suggested hope for improvement. Not so the Spanish homes. Their low, adobe, wide-roofed cabins, neatly enclosed with even basketwork fence and lining hedge of blooming hollyhock. We stopped to bow good morning to my friend and stage companion, the Donna. She sat in the threshold of her open door, sewing. Beyond her stretched a bare floor, clean and white. The few chairs, the table spread with snowy linen, everything, shone with an air of religious spotlessness. Symmetry reigned in the precise, well-kept garden, arranged in rows of pepper plants and crisp heads of vernal lettuce. I longed for a painter to catch her brilliant smile and surround her on canvas as she was here with order and dignity. The same plain black dress clad her heavy ample figure, and about the neck heavy barbaric gold beads served again as collar. Under low eaves above her, and quite around the house, hung in triple row festoons of flaming red peppers in delicious contrast with the rich adobe gray. It was a study of order and true womanly repose, fitted to cheer us, and a grouping of such splendid color as might tempt a painter to cross the world. A little farther on, we passed an Indian ranchero, where several willow wickiups were built upon the bank of a cold brook. Half-naked children played about here and there, a few old squaws bustled at household work, but nearly all lay outstretched, dozing. A sort of tattered brilliancy characterized the place. Gay, high-colored squalor reigned. There seemed hardly more lack of thrift or sense of decorum than in the American ranches, Yet somehow the latter send a stab of horror through one, while this quaint indolence and picturesque neglect seem aptly contrived to set off the Indian genius for loafing and leave you with a sort of aesthetic satisfaction, rather than the sorrow their half-development should properly evoke. Leaving all this behind us, our road led westward across a long sage slope entering a narrow, torturous pass through a low range of outlying granite hills. Strangely weathered forms towered on either side, their bare, brown surface contrasting pleasantly with the vivid ribbon of willows which wove a green and silver cover over swift water. The granite was riven with innumerable cracks, showing here and there a strong tendency to concentric forms, and I judged the immense spheroidal boulders which lay on all sides, piled one upon another, 
to be the kernels or nuclei of larger masses. Quickly crossing this ridge, we came out upon the true Sierra foot slope, a broad inclined plain stretching north and south as far as we could see. Directly in front of us rose the rugged form of Mount Whitney Spur, a single mass of granite, rough hewn, and darkened with coniferous groves. The summits were lost in a cloud of almost indigo hue. Putting our horses at a trot, we quickly ascended the glacis and at the very foot of the rocks dismounted and made up our packs. Jose, with the horses, left us and went back half a mile to a mountain ranch where he was to await our return. And presently Pinson and I, with heavy burdens upon our backs, began slowly to work our way up the granite spur and toward the great canyon. An hour's climb brought us around upon the south wall of our spur and about a thousand feet above a stream which dashed and leaped along the canyon bottom through wild ravines and over granite bluffs. Our slope was a rugged rock face, giving foothold here and there to pine and juniper trees, but for the greater part bare and bold. Far above, at an elevation of 10,000 feet, a dark grove of alpine pines gathered in the canyon bed. Thither we bent our steps, edging from cleft to cleft, making constant, though insignificant, progress. At length our walk became so wild and deeply cut with side canyons, we found it impossible to follow it longer, and descended carefully to the bottom. Almost immediately, with heavy wind gusts and sound as of torrents, a storm broke upon us, darkening the air and drenching us to the skin. The three hours we toiled up over rocks, through dripping willow brooks and among trains of debris, were not noticeable for their cheerfulness. The storm had ceased, but it was evening when, wet and exhausted, we at length reached the alpine grove and threw ourselves down for rest under a huge overhanging rock which offered its shelter for our bivouac. Logs, soon brought in by Pinson, were kindled. The hot blaze seemed pleasant to us, though I cannot claim to have enjoyed those two hours spent in turning round and round before it while steaming and drying. But the broiled beef, the toast, and those generous cups of tea to which we devoted the hour between ten and eleven were quite satisfactory. So, too, was the pleasant chat, till midnight warned us to roll up in overcoats and close our eyes to the fire, to the dark, somber grove, and far stars crowding the now cloudless heavens. The sun arose and shone on us while we breakfasted, through all the visible sky, not a cloud could be seen, and thanks to yesterday's rain, the air was of crystal purity. Into it, the granite summits above us projected forms of sunlit gray. Up the glacier valley above camp, we slowly tramped through a forest of noble Pinus flexilis, the trunks of bright sienna contrasting richly with deep bronze foliage. Minor flutings of a medial moraine offered gentle grade and agreeable footing for a mile and more, after which, by degrees, the woods gave way to a wide-open amphitheater surrounded with cliffs. I can never enter one of these great hollow mountain chambers without a pause. There is a grandeur and spaciousness which expand and fit the mind for yet larger sensations when you shall stand on the height above. Velvet of alpine sward, edging an icy brooklet by whose margin we sat down, reached to the right and left, far enough to spread a narrow foreground over which we saw a chain of peaks swelling from either side toward our amphitheater's head, where, springing splendidly over them all, stood the sharp form of Whitney. Precipices, white with light and snow fields of incandescent brilliance, grouped themselves along walls and slopes all around us, and wild, huge heaps lay wreck of glacier and avalanche. We started again, passing the last two, 
and began to climb painfully up loose debris and lodged blocks of the north wall, from here to the very foot of that granite pyramid which crowns the mountain, we found neither difficulty nor danger, only a long, tedious climb, over footing which from time to time gave way provokingly. By this time mist floated around the brow of Mount Whitney, forming a gray helmet from which, now and then, the wind blew out long, waving plumes. After a brief rest, we began to scale the southeast ridge, climbing from rock to rock and making our way up steep fields of soft snow. Precipices, sharp and severe, fell away to east and west of us, but the rough pile above still afforded a way. We had to use extreme caution, for many blocks hung ready to fall at a touch, and the snow, where we were forced to work up it, often gave way, threatening to hurl us down into cavernous hollows. When within a hundred feet of the top, I suddenly fell through, but supporting myself by my arms, looked down into a grotto of rock and ice and out through a sort of window over the western bluffs and down thousands of feet to the faraway valley of the Kern. I carefully and slowly worked my body out and crept on hands and knees up over a steep and treacherous ice crest where a slide would have swept me over a brink of the southern precipice. We kept to the granite as much as possible, Pinson taking one train of blocks and I another. Above us, but thirty feet, rose a crest beyond which we saw nothing. I dared not think of the summit till we stood there, and Mount Whitney was under our feet. Close beside us, a small mound of rock was piled upon the peak and solidly built into it an Indian arrow shaft pointing due west. I climbed out to the southwest brink and, looking down, could see that fatal precipice which had prevented me seven years before. I strained my eyes beyond, but already dense, impenetrable clouds had closed us in. On the whole, this climb was far less dangerous than I had reason to hope. Only at the very crest, where ice and rock are thrown together insecurely, did we encounter any very trying work. The utter unreliableness of that honeycomb and cavernous cliff was rather uncomfortable and might at any moment give the death fall to one who had not coolness and muscular power at instant command. I hung my barometer from the mound of our Indian predecessor, nor did I grudge his hunter pride the honor of first finding that one pathway to the summit of the United States, 15,000 feet above two oceans. While we lunched, I engraved Pinson's and my name upon a half dollar and placed it in a hollow of the crest. Clouds still hung motionless over us, but in half an hour a west wind drew across, lifting the heavy vapors along with it. Light poured in, reddening the clouds, which soon rolled away, opening a grand view of the western Sierra Ridge and of the whole system of the Kern. Only here and there could blue sky be seen, but fortunately the sun streamed through one of these windows in the storm, lighting up splendidly the snowy rank from Kawea to Mount Brewer. There they rose, as of old, firm and solid, even the great snow fields, though somewhat shrunken, lay as they had seven years before. I saw the peaks and passes and amphitheaters dear old Cotter and I had climbed, even that Mount Brewer Pass where we looked back over the pathway of our dangers and up with regretful hearts to the very rock on which I sat. Deep below flowed the Kern, its hundred snow-fed branches gleaming out amid rock and ice, or traced far away in the great glacier trough by dark lines of pine. There, only twelve miles northwest, stretched that ragged divide where Cotter and I came down the precipice with our rope. Beyond, into the vague blue of King's Canyon, 
sloped the ice and rock of Mount Brewer Wall. Somber storm clouds and their even gloomier shadows darkened the northern sea of peaks. Only a few slant bars of sudden light flashed in upon purple granite and fields of ice. The rocky tower of Mount Tyndall, thrust up through rolling billows, caught for a moment the full light and then sank into darkness and mist. When all else was buried in cloud, we watched the great west range. Weird and strange, it seemed shaded by some dark eclipse. Here and there, through its gaps and passes, serpent-like streams of mist floated in and crept slowly down the canyons of the hither slope, then all along the crest, torn and rushing spray of clouds whirled about the peaks, and in a moment a vast gray wave reared high and broke, overwhelming all. Just for a moment, every trace of vapor cleared away from the east, unveiling for the first time spurs and gorges and plains. I crept to a brink and looked down into the Whitney Canyon, which was crowded with light. Great scarred and ice-hewn precipices reached down 4,000 feet, curving together like a ship and holding in their granite bed a thread of brook, the small sapphire gems of alpine lake, bronze dots of pine, and here and there a fine enameling of snow. Beyond and below lay Owens Valley, walled in by the barren Inyo chain, and afar, under a pale sad sky, lengthened leagues and leagues of lifeless desert. The storm had even swept across Kern Canyon and dashed high against the peaks north and south of us. A few sharp needles and spikes struggled above it for a moment, but it rolled over them and rushed in torrents down the desert slope, burying everything in a dark, swift cloud. We hastened to pack up our barometer and descend. A little way down the ice crust gave way under Pinson, but he saved himself and we hurried on, reaching safely the cliff base, leaving all dangerous ground above us. So dense was the cloud, we could not see a hundred feet, but tramped gaily down the rocks and sand, feeling quite assured of our direction until suddenly we came upon the brink of a precipice and strained our eyes off into the mist. I threw a stone over and listened in vain for the sound of its fall, Pinson and I both thought we had deviated too far to the north and were on the brink of Whitney Canyon, so we turned in the opposite direction, thinking to cross the ridge, entering our old amphitheater, but in a few moments we again found ourselves upon the verge. This time a stone we threw over answered with a faint dull crash from 500 feet below. We were evidently upon a narrow blade. I remembered no such place and sat down to carefully recall every detail of topography. At last I concluded that we had either strayed down upon the Kern side or were on one of the cliffs overhanging the head of our true amphitheater. Feeling the necessity of keeping cool, I determined to ascend to the foot of the snow and search for our tracks. So we slowly climbed up there again and took a new start. By this time, the wind howled fiercely, bearing a chill from snow crystals and sleet. We hurried on before it, and after one or two vain attempts, succeeded in finding our old trail down the amphitheater slope, descending very rapidly to its floor. From here, an exhausting tramp of five hours through the pine forest to our camp, and on down the rough, wearying slopes of the lower canyon brought us to the plain where Jose and the horses awaited us. From Lone Pine that evening and from the open carriage in which I rode northward to Independence, I constantly looked back and up into the storm, hoping to catch one more glimpse of Mount Whitney, but all the range lay submerged in dark rolling cloud from which now and then a sullen mutter of thunder reverberated. For years, our chief, Professor Whitney, 
has made brave campaigns into the unknown realm of nature. Against low prejudice and dull indifference, he has led the survey of California onward to success. There stand for him two monuments, one a great report made by his own hand, another the loftiest peak in the Union, begun for him in the planet's youth and sculptured of enduring granite by the slow hand of time. End of chapter 13 Mount Whitney Chapter 14 of Mountaineering in the Sierra Nevada by Clarence King This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 14 The People If mankind were offspring of isothermal lines and topography, we might arrive at a just criticism of Sierra Nevada people by that cheap and rapid method so much in vogue nowadays among physical geographers. Their practice of dragooning the free agent with wet and dry bulb thermometers would help us to predict the future of Sierra society, but little more securely than Madame St. John, who also deals in coming events. I fear we have no better than the old way of developing what lies ahead logically from yesterday and today, adding large measure of sympathy with human aspiration and faith in divine help. Why all sorts and conditions of men from every race upon the planet wanted gold and twenty years ago came here to win it, I shall not concern myself to ask, nor can I formulate very accurately the proportions of good, bad, and indifferent dramatis personae upon whom the golden curtain of 49 rolled up. No venerated landmark or sacred restraint held those men in check. There were no precedents for the acting, no playbook, no prompter, no audience. Anglo-Saxondom's idea reigned supreme developing a plot of riotous situation and inconceivably sudden change. Wit and intellect brought a condition the most ambitious savages might regard with baffled envy. History would not, if she could, parallel the state of society here from 49 to 55, nor can we imagine to what height of horror it might have reached had the Sierra drainage held unlimited gold. Those were lively days. The penniless 49er still looks back to them with bleared eyes as the one period of his life. Dust was plenty and to be had, if not for digging, at the modest price of a bullet. To prove the soil's fertility, he tells you proudly how, in those years, wild oats on every hill grew tall enough to be tied across your saddlebow. This irony of nature has passed away but the cursed plant ripens its hundredfold in life and manner. No one familiar with society, as it then was, feels the least surprise that Mr. Bret Hart should deal so largely in morbid anatomy or appear to search painfully for a single noble trait to redeem the common bad, yet not universal bad, for there were not wanting a few strong Christian men who amid all kept their eyes on the one model, leading lives blameless, if obscure. Broadly, through all kind and condition, shone the virtue of generous, if not self-denying, hospitality, a sort of open-handed fraternity banded together the honest miners. They were shoulder to shoulder in common quest of gold, in united effort to make the camp lively. The fraternity too often emulated that of Cain, or wore a ghastly likeness to the commune. That those desperados, who, through the long chain of mining towns, outnumbered respectable men, had so generally the fixed habit of killing one another, should rather be written down to their credit. That they never married, to hand down lawless traits, seems their crowning virtue. For a few years the solemn pines looked down on a mad carnival of godless license, a pandemonium in whose picturesque delirium human character crumbled and 
vanished like dead leaves. It was stirring and gay, but Melpomene's pathetic face was always under that laughing mask of comedy. This is the unpromising origin of our Sierra civilization. It may be instructive to note some early steps of improvement, a protest, first silent, then loud, which went up against disorder and crime, and later the inauguration of justice in form, if not reality. There occurs to be an incident illustrating these first essays in civil law. It is vouched for by my friend, an unwilling actor in the affair. Exactly why horse-stealing should have been so early recognized as a heinous sin, it is not easy to discover. However that might be, murderers continued to notch the number of their victims on neatly kept hilts of pistol or knives in comparative security long after the horse-thief began to meet his hempen fate. Early in the fifties, on a still, hot summer's afternoon, a certain man, in a camp of the northern mines which shall be nameless, having tracked his two donkeys and one horse a half-mile, and discovering that a man's track with spur marks followed them, came back to town and told the boys, who loitered about a popular saloon, that in his opinion some Mexican had stole the animals. Such news as this naturally demanded drinks all round. Do you know, gentlemen, said one who assumed leadership, that just naturally to shoot these greasers ain't the best way. Give them a fair jury trial and rope them up with all the majesty of law. That's secure. Such words of moderation were well received, and they drank again to, here's hoping we catch that greaser. As they loafed back to the veranda, a Mexican walked over the hill brow jingling his spurs pleasantly in accord with a whistled waltz. The advocate for law said in undertone, That's a cuss. A rush, a struggle, and the Mexican, bound hand and foot, lay on his back in the barroom. The camp turned out to a man. Happily such cries as, String him up! Burn the doggone lubricator! And other equally pleasant phrases fell unheeded upon his Spanish ear. A jury, upon which they forced my friend, was quickly gathered in the street, and despite refusals to serve, the crowd hurried them in behind the bar. A brief statement of the case was made by the C. Devant advocate, and they shoved the jury into a commodious poker room, where were seats grouped about neat green tables. The noise outside in the bar room by and by died away into complete silence, but from afar... Down the canyon came confused sounds as of disorderly cheering. They came nearer, and again the light-hearted noise of human laughter mingled with clinking glasses around the bar. A low knock at the jury door. The lock burst in, and a dozen smiling fellows asked the verdict. A foreman promptly answered, Not guilty. With volleyed oaths, an ominous laying of hands on pistol hilts, the boys slammed the door with, You'll have to do better than that. In half an hour, the advocate gently opened the door again. Your opinion, gentlemen. Guilty. Correct. You can come out. We hung him an hour ago. The jury took theirs next, and when, after a few minutes, the pleasant village returned to its former tranquility, it was allowed at more than one saloon that... Mexicans'll know enough to let white men's stock alone after this. One and another exchanged the belief that this sort of thing was more sensible than nipping them on sight. When before sunset, the barkeeper concluded to sweep some dust out of his poker room back door, he felt a momentary surprise at finding the missing horse, dozing under the shadow of an oak, and the two lost donkeys serenely masticating playing cards, of which many bushels lay in a dusty pile. He was reminded then that the animals had been there all day. 
During three or four years, the battle between good and bad became more and more determined until all positive characters arrayed themselves either for or against public order. At length, on a sudden, the party for right organized those august mobs, the Vigilance Committees, and quickly began to festoon their more depraved fellow men from tree to tree. Rogues of sufficient shrewdness got themselves enrolled in the vigilance ranks and were soon unable to tell themselves from the most virtuous. Those quiet oaks, whose hundreds of sunny years had been spent in lengthening out glorious branches, now found themselves playing the part of a public gibbet. Let it be distinctly understood that I am not passing criticism on the San Francisco organization, which I have never investigated, but on committees in the mountain towns with whose performance I am familiar. The vigilance quickly put out of existence a majority of the worst desperados and, by their swift, merciless action, struck such terror into the rest that ever after the right has mainly controlled affairs. This was, perhaps, well... With characteristic promptness, they laid down their power and gave California over to the constituted authorities. This was magnificent. They deserve the commendation due success. They have, however, such a frank, honest way of singing their praise, such eternal, undisguised, and virtuous self-laudation over the whole matter, that no one else need interrupt them with fainter tones. Although this generation has written its endorsement in full upon the transaction, it may be doubted if history, how long is it before dispassionate candor speaks, will trace an altogether favorable verdict upon her pages, possibly to fulfill the golden round of duty. It is needful to do right in the right way, and success may not be proven the eternal test of merit. That the vigilance committees grasped the moral power is undeniable. That they used it for the public salvation is equally true. But the best advocates are far from showing that with skill and moderation they might not have thrown their weight into the scale with law and conquered, by means of legislature, judge, and jury, a peace wholly free from the stain of lawless blood. An impartial future may possibly grant the plenary inspiration of vigilance committees. Perhaps that better choice was in truth denied them. It may be the hour demanded a sudden blow of self-defense. Whether better or best, the act has not left unmixed blessing, although it now seems as if the lawlessness, which even till these later years has from time to time manifested itself, is gradually and surely dying out. Yet today, as I write, state troops are encamped at Amador to suppress a spirit which has taken law in its own hand. With a gradual decline of gold product, something like social equilibrium asserted itself. By 1860, California had made the vast inspiring stride from barbarism to regularity. In failing gold industry and the gradual abandonment of placer ground to Chinamen, there is abundant pathos. You see it in a hundred towns and camps where empty buildings in disrepair stand in rows. No nailing up of blinds or closing of doors hides the vacancy. The cheap squalor of Chinese streets adds misery to the scene, besides scenting a pure mountain air with odors of complete wretchedness. Pigs prowl the streets. Every deserted cabin knows the story of brave, manly effort ended in bitter failure, and the lingering stranded men have a melancholy look as of faint fish the ebb has left to die. I recall one town into which our party rode at evening. A single family alone remained, too desperately poor to leave their home. All the other buildings, church, post office, the half-dozen saloons and many dwellings, standing with wide-open doors, 
their cloth walls and ceilings torn down to make Indian petticoats. If our horses in the great deserted livery stable were as comfortable as we, who each made his bed on a billiard table, they did well. With this slow decay, the venturous, both good and bad, have drifted off to other mining countries, leaving, most often, small cause to regret them. Pathos and comedy so tenderly blent can rarely be found as here. Enterprise has shrunken away from its old belongings. A feeble rill of trade trickles down the broad channel of former affluence. Those few 49ers who linger ought to be gently preserved for historic specimens, as we used to care for that cannonball in the Boston bricks, or whatever might remind this youthful country of a past. They are altogether harmless now, possessing the peculiar charm of lions with drawn teeth. Behold this old-school relic, a type known as the real Virginia gentleman, as of a mild summer twilight, he walks along the quiet street, clad in black broadcloth and spotless linen, a heavy cane hanging by its curved handle from his wrist. He pauses by the saloon, receiving respectful salutation from a mild company of bummers who hold him in awe, and call him nothing less than judge. They omit their habitual sugar and water, and are at pains to swallow as stiff a glass and as neat as their hero. The judge is reminded of livelier days by certain unhealed bullet holes in ceiling and wall and recounts for the hundredth time in chaste language the whole affair, and in particular how three-fingered Jack blew the top of Alabama's head off, and that stopped it all. We buried the six, the judge continues, side and side, and it wasn't a week before two of us found old Jack and his partner on the same limb, and they made eight graves. The ball that made that hole went through my hat and I traveled after that for a while till the thing sort of blew over. Ah, boys, he winds up in tones tremulous with tearful regret. You fellows will never see such lively times as we of the early days. His tall figure passes on with uncertain gait, stopping at garden fences here and there to execute one or two old school compliments for the ladies who are spending their evenings under vine draped porches, and when he takes an easy chair by invitation and begins a story laid in the spring of fifty, the judge is conscious in his heart that the full saloon veranda is looking and saying, the women always did like him. The forty-nine rough, too, still stays in almost every camp. He evaded rope by joining the vigilance and has become a safe and fangless wolf in sheep's clothing. He found early that he could sponge and swindle a larger amount from any given community than could be plundered, to say nothing of the advantages of personal security. But now all these characters are, God be thanked, few and widely scattered. Our present census enrolls a safe, honest, reputable population who respect law and personal rights, and who, besides, look into the future with a sense of responsibility and resolve. It is very much the habit of newly arrived people to link the past and present too closely in their estimate of the existing status. That dreadful nightmare of early years is unfortunately, not to say cruelly, mixed up with today. I think this must in great measure account for the virtuous horror of that saintly army of travelers who write about California, taking pains to open fire at sublimely long range, with their very hottest shot upon the devoted dwellers here. Such bombardment in large pica, with all the added severity of double letting, does not interrupt the Sierra tranquility. They marry and are given in marriage, as in the days of Noah, regardless of explosions of many literary batteries. Nor is this peaceful state altogether because the projectiles fall short, there are people here who read, and read thoroughly. 
Can we think them hypersensitive if surprised when, after opening heart and doors to scribbling visitors, they find themselves held up to ridicule or execration in unimpeachable English and tasteful topography? An equally false impression is spread by that considerable class of men whose courage and energy were not enough to win in open contest there, and who publicly shake off dust from departing feet, go east in ballast, and make a virtue of burning their ships, forgetful that for one waterlogged craft a hundred stanch keels will furrow the golden gate. Between the cruelly superficial criticism of most Eastern writers and dark predictions from those smug prophets, the physical geographers, Californians have nothing left them but their own conscious power, not the poorest reliance in practical business, like building futures, one should say. I'm not going to deny that, even yet, there flickers up now and then a lingering flame of that 49 inferno. If I did, the lively and picturesque auto de fe of Austrian George the other day would be moved to amend me. We must admit the facts. California people are not living in a tranquil, healthy social regime. They are provincial, never, however, in a local way, but by reason of limited thought. Aspirations for wealth and ease rise conspicuously above any thirst for intellectual culture and moral peace. Energy and a glorious audacity are their leading traits. To the charge of light-hearted gaiety, so freely trumpeted by graver home critics, I plead them guilty. There is nowhere that dull, weary expression and rayless sedateness of face we of New England are fonder of ascribing to our tender conscience than to east winds. So, too, are wanting difficulties of bronchia and lungs, which might inferentially be symptoms of original sin. Is Californian cheerfulness due to widespread moral levity, or because perpetual sunshine and green salads through the round year tempt weak human nature to smile? I believe it climatic, and humbly offer my tribute to the thermometer man, who among many ventures has this time probably stumbled upon truth. Let us not grieve because the writers and lecturers have not found Californian society all their ideals demanded, for, saving always the dry bulb breeders of past and future, their dictum is confined to existing conditions. Have they forgotten that these are less potent factors in development than the impulse, that what a man is is of far less consequence than what he is becoming. Show these gloomy critics a bare stretch of vulgar Sierra earth, and they will tell you how barren, how valueless it is, ignorant that the art of any Californian can banish every grain of sand into the Pacific's bottom and gather a residuum of solid gold. Out of the race of men, whom they have in the same shallow way called common, I believe time shall separate a noble race. Traveling today in foothill sierras, one may see the old rude scars of mining. Trenches yawn, disordered heaps cumber the ground, and yet they are no longer bare. Time, with friendly rain and winded flood, slowly, surely levels all, and a compassionate cover of innocent verdure weaves fresh and cool from mile to mile. While nature thus gently heals the humble earth, God, who is also nature, molds and changes man. The End End of Chapter 14 the People. Recording by Melanie Schleter McHelmont, Madison, Wisconsin. On the web at melanie.mchelmont.org. End of Mountaineering in the Sierra Nevada by Clarence King.